Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. And be sure to hit the bell notification so you always get notified whenever I have a new video. Hope you enjoy this. So, uh, howdy, folks, and uh, I'm Jimmy Aiken. Joining me today is Cameron Bertuzzi of Capturing Christianity, and we're doing another installment of what I've taken to call in the Atheist Book Club, where we read uh, from a book by atheists and give our thoughts on it as Christian philosophers. So today we're reading from Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion. Last time we read on Cameron's channel uh, from Chapter 3 of the book, and we got through the first few sections of the book where he covered some some of the this this chapter is devoted to arguments for the existence of God and why Richard Dawkins doesn't um, doesn't believe they work. And last time we at the beginning of the chapter he had some of the classic arguments for the existence of God, like Aquinas's five ways and so forth. And we got through those, and so now we're uh, kind of at a point where we're dealing some with some arguments that he says are common, but they're not the classic ones. And so, uh, before we get started, uh, Cameron, is there anything you'd like to say? Well, I would like to just let the audience know that in Chapter 3, like you mentioned on my channel, we got through the first two sections, Thomas Aquinas, uh, the, first, the uh, five ways, and then also uh, ontological arguments and other a priori arguments. So, uh, we ended up spending a lot of our time talking about those two sections, and then in this one, uh, we'd like to cover the argument from beauty, the argument from personal experience, and the argument from scripture. Possibly, the next one we'll we'll just have to see. I mean, we're gonna because we're reading this out loud, and then we're gonna share our thoughts sort of as we go. Um, but yeah, I was I was yeah I was I was telling you before uh, before we went live that um, as I was sort of perusing these sections and just kind of skimming them before we went live. Uh, I, it kind of struck me. I mean, I, I've developed over the years a sort of way of thinking about the arguments for and, exen for and against the existence of God, and I don't really see him interacting with that much. And that's I don't think that's much fault on on his part because I think some of this stuff, well, some of it is rather old. So it's it sort of stems from a guy named Richard Swinburne, who is a very well known Christian philosopher. He's got some really good stuff on uh, natural theology, apologetics, arguments for the existence of God. Um, I'd be curious to, to know if, if uh, Dawkins actually interacts with his work, but anyways, I, I've developed this way of thinking about it that I think is going to be helpful when we look at, for example, the uh, the argument from beauty. I think there's going to be, uh, from what I saw in the book, Dawkins doesn't really deal with like this, the strongest version of the argument. And um, so, yeah, I'd like to uh, kind of explain that as, as we go along and, and maybe the audience will get something out of that just to mm -hmm. uh, a helpful way i think of of framing the issue and kind of helping like taking a step back and like how do we actually assess these two hypotheses because we got atheism on the one hand and then theism or perfect being theism on the other hand those are kind of the two main hypotheses that uh, people are kind of taking a look at these days and um yeah so I i'm excited though this should this should be uh fun and interesting you know what richard dawkins actually saw on his uh his twitter he was inviting people to to kind of comment and like leave their thoughts on that's i think what sort of inspired the, the thumbnail of this video is that he's been inviting people to to come in and, and sort of take him. shots debunk them from uh you know religious standpoint so i'm excited to do that yeah okay well then let's get started so uh here we have uh chapter three of his book on kindle and where we're starting is down at the lower right hand bottom of the page where it says the argument from beauty so it says, and I'm going to pull up my Kindle here so I can control the pages, another characteristic in the Aldous Huxley novel just mentioned, and this is a Huxley novel that he had been discussing called Point Counterpoint, um, where a mathem someone discovers a mathematical proof for the existence of God. But he says, another characteristic in the Aldous Huxley novel just mentioned proved the existence of God by playing Beethoven's String Quartet Number no. 15 in A minor. Heiliger Gerdanke song uh, on a gramophone. Unconvincing as that sounds, it does it does represent a popular strand of argument. I have given up counting the number of times I received the more or less truculent challenge. How do you account for Shakespeare then? Substitute Schubert, Michelangelo, etc. To taste, the argument will be so familiar I needn't document it further. But the logic behind it is never spelled out, and the more you think about 
it, the more vacuous you realize it to be. Obviously, Beethoven's late quartets are sublime, so are Shakespeare's sonnets. They are sublime if God is there, and they are sublime if he isn't. They do not prove the existence of God. They prove the existence of Beethoven and of Shakespeare. A great conductor is credited with saying, if you have Mozart to listen to, why do you need God? So before going on, I want to mention that part of what he's saying here is not wrong. Uh, you do have, obviously, there there are arguments for God's existence based on beauty, and sometimes they are presented in a way that doesn't really spell out the reasoning behind them. For example, in the book, The Handbook of Christian Apologetics by Peter Kreeft and Ronald Ticelli, they start with an argument with a chapter called 20 Arguments for the Existence of God, and their version of the argument from aesthetic experience or beauty is th- the the music of Johann Sebastian Bach exists, therefore God exists, and they say you either see this or you don't. And so, yeah, they, they make an appeal to beauty that exists, and then they infer God's existence, but they don't really spell out the reasoning. They just say you either see this or you don't. And I think they kind of threw that in kind of as a joke argument. I don't know that they meant it to be taken super seriously, but uh, Cameron, do you have any thoughts on that kind of basic form of the argument? Um, the form the, the form of the argument that I like, um, which he doesn't talk about, I don't think he talks about it at all in this section. Um, and again, I've only sort of uh, skimmed it, so I don't know exactly what he argues, but mm-hmm. we're, we're going to get through that in just a minute. Um, the version of the argument that I like is uh, it doesn't even necessarily rely on the existence of any kind of like objective beauty. So beauty doesn't even have to be objective. It could still be subjective. And uh, I think the argument still works, which uh, is really interesting to think about. And it, it, it does go back to uh, what I was talking about earlier, how it's it's really important how you frame the issue, how you frame the whole dialogue in this, you know, try, this, this competition between theism and atheism. It's really important how you sort of frame it. And um, I think once we frame it correctly, a lot of the objections that Dawkins has, which aren't necessarily even objections, like one of the things he says is, the argument will be so familiar, I need to document it further, further, but the logic behind it is never spelled out. Like, that's obviously false. There are versions of Mm -hmm. the argument from beauty that he just doesn't address. And the more you think about it, the more vacuous you realize it to be. Like, that's really just a pronouncement. Like, that's that's not any sort of argument or anything or or interaction with with any type of argument. And... um, I mean, for for me personally, I've I've like found the opposite to be true. The more that I've thought about beauty, the more I I feel like it it does, at least give some sort of evidence for the existence of God. And hopefully, I, as we go through this stream, mm-hmm. um, I'll, I'll have a chance to kind of spell that out a little bit more in in more detail. At least you know how it appears to me and and how I sort of think about these issues. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my thoughts on this section. Okay. Uh, Dawkins in says, I once was the guest of the week on a British radio show called Desert Island Discs. You have to choose the eight records you would take with you if marooned on a desert island. Among my choices was Mache dich mein Herzerein from Bach St. Matthew Passion. The interviewer was unable to understand how I could choose religious music without being religious. You might as well say, how can you enjoy Weather and Heights when you know perfectly well that Kathy and Heathcliff never really existed? Of course, Weather and Heights is a famous 19th century British novel. Uh, but there is in an additional point that I might have made, and which needs to be made whenever religion is given any credit for, say, the Sistine Chapel or Raphael's Annunciation. Even great artists have to earn a living, and they will take commissions where they are to be had. I have no reason to doubt that Raphael and Michelangelo were Christians. It was pretty much the only option in their time. But the fact is almost incidental. Its enormous wealth had made the church the dominant patron of the arts. If history had worked out differently and Michelangelo had been commissioned to paint a ceiling for a giant museum of science, mightn't he have produced something at least as inspirational as the Sistine Chapel? 
How sad that we shall never hear Beethoven's Mesozoic Symphony or Mozart's opera, The Expanding Universe. And what a shame that we are deprived of Haydn's evolution oratorio. But that doesn't stop us from enjoying his creation. To approach the argument from the other side, what if, as my wife Chillin Lee suggests to me, Shakespeare had been obliged to work to commission from the church. We'd surely have lost Hamlet, King Lear, and Macbeth. And what would we have gained in return? Such stuff as dreams are made on? Dream on. So he here he's got, um, I think, some you know valid points. Artists do make a living, and they do historically work on commission from patrons. And the patron gets to choose significantly what the artist creates. You know, there's that old saying, uh, he who pays the fiddler calls the tune. And so, you know, when when the Pope hired Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling, the Pope kind of determined it's going to have a religious theme. If, if Michelangelo had just painted a bunch of secular art up there, he wouldn't have gotten paid, and his work would have been replaced. So there is an element of truth here. Although, frankly, I find the idea of Mozart's opera, the expanding universe, really boring. I doubt Mozart would write an opera like that because operas have to have plots, and it's really hard to tell a story about the expanding universe. But, um, you know, there is a measure of truth here. Any thoughts on this section, Cameron? Um, yeah, there's not a whole lot more here. I mean, he, he does. Well, I was kind of reading ahead a little bit and looking mm -hmm. at the next section. So maybe we could just read that and then I'll sure. share okay. some more overall thoughts. If there is a logical argument linking the existence of great art to the existence of God, it is not spelled out by its proponents. It is simply assumed to be self-evident, which it most certainly is not. Maybe it is to be seen as yet another version of the argument from design. Schubert's musical brain is a wonder of improbability, even more so than the vertebrate eye. Or, more, more ignobly, uh, perhaps it is a sort of jealousy of genius. How dare another human being make such beautiful music, poetry, or art when I can't? It must be God that did it. So that's his conclusion to the argument from beauty. He has a very short treatment of it, and he's only interacting with some fairly superficial versions of it. Yeah, and then and then the, the, the main thing that, that sort of struck out or, or uh, struck me is that he says that the logical argument linking the existence of great art to the existence of God is not spelled out by its proponents. Um, that I know is false, like Swinburne mentions it in The Existence of God. And um, and that came out, I think, well before this book was published. So th mm -hmm. there, there are many examples of the argument from beauty being made in a much more rigorous fashion that he just doesn't mention here. And um, yeah, I mean, that that's, that's kind of like what I've come to expect. I mean, we've only read a few sections from The God Delusion, but it seems like that's his his uh one of his strategies is to just say well since i haven't seen it it doesn't exist and so i can just kind of dismiss it offhand um one thing i wanted to kind of circle back to now that we've read the whole section is there's a line that he mentions in his first paragraph that says they do not prove the existence of god they prove the existence of beethoven and shakespeare and i think what what dawkins is missing is that the question about beauty goes deeper than that it goes um, like when we're comparing theism and atheism the these are like fundamental hypotheses about reality and so you've got to have some sort of explanation why those sorts of people exist in the first place why is there someone like a Be beethoven or a shakespeare in the first place that can produce these really beautiful pieces of art that's kind of like the deeper question and so if he wants to say they prove the existence of beethoven and shakespeare the next step then would be, well, what is the best explanation comparing theism and atheism? What, which of these hypotheses best explains the existence of these people that can create these things? And he doesn't really um, deal with that, but I don't even think it's really even on his radar. Is that he's, and I think this also becomes apparent in the, the next section too, when we get to the argument from personal experience. Um, because he kind of explains personal experience, and I think it's the same with beauty, is that he explains, well, we have these th other things that we can sort of appeal to that explain beauty, like there's Beethoven and Shakespeare, um, and then in personal experience, like there's brains, you know, and that's that's kind of like his, I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit, but that's, that's kind of his overall approach, um, but there's a lot of reasons to 
think that that's a sort of superficial way of looking at the whole issue. Because again, we want to look at like what deepest explanation of reality, and here we're thinking about atheism versus perfect being theism, which one of these better explains what we're seeing in the world? And what we're seeing here, the phenomenon question that we're discussing in this section is beauty, like the argument from beauty, really beautiful songs, really beautiful art. Uh, what what sort of explains that? Is it is that more expected on theism or is it more expected on atheism? And I, I think, I mean, to me, the more I think about this, the, the deeper I go on this, it seems obvious that theism has a much uh, has, has the, the, the upper hand here to a degree that it's just like, it's, it's just so obvious. And I think atheists should also admit to this. Like they should admit that there are pieces of evidence on both sides. At least they should make that concession. So you, you just because you admit there is some evidence for theism doesn't mean that you now need to become a theist. You can just admit, Hey, there's some evidence that goes this way. But then, you know, in my view, if I were an atheist, I would say, well, the total evidence still shows that atheism is true. And so you don't have to be afraid of like admitting that there's something here, something in the world that makes people think that God exists. And that's the, the you know, there's a sort of rational basis for making that inference. Okay. But, but yeah. Let me, let me try to steal man Dawkins then here. So, okay, let's take your argument that we've got these people like Shakespeare and Michelangelo and Schubert, and they produce really beautiful stuff. So we agree that we have these beauty producers. The question is, how do we explain the beauty producers? Now, you, Mr. Theist, have posited that God has endowed them with the ability to produce beauty, but I could come along and say, well, I don't believe in God, I believe in evolution. And so I would say, speaking from this point of view, that, um, that there is no God and there is an undesigned process of evolution that encourages the survival and thriving of organisms. And as part of that, organisms develop certain preferences. And, you know, they prefer things that promote survival, they prefer things that promote pleasure. And so in the human organism, they've developed a certain set of preferences for things that they regard beautiful. And it's not just humans that do that. We see, for example, uh, in other species like lions, let's say, lions are sexually attracted to other lions that have symmetrical facial features because if they have symmetrical facial features that's a sign of reproductive fitness as opposed to a lion that has deformities and an asymmetrical face and in the same way there are certain there are certain characteristics of other humans that humans find beautiful and there are certain characteristics in music that humans find beautiful and all of this is just the product of evolution and i don't need to propose the existence of a god in order to explain it how would you respond to that steel man version of dawkins yeah so i've given a lot of thought to these types of objections and i think what you can do with almost any hypothesis that you come up with and you can apply this all over the place it doesn't just just uh apply to questions about god's existence and theism or atheism you can always add to a hypothesis something that is going to nevertheless like explain the data in the long run um but then the question is how likely is that data given the hypothesis so in this case you added or you conjoined atheism and evolution so you said, well, if I, you know, I, I'm an atheist, I believe in evolution. And so evolution sort of explains why there's people like Shakespeare. Uh, and that sort of explains the beauty that we see in the world. Um, I don't think that actually explains all of the beauty. I think that just explains some of the examples. So like a beautiful sunset, like, you know, the creation or evolution is not going to explain that. Um, but the, the point here is that you can always combine with your hypothesis something to it that is auxiliary to that hypothesis in order to explain the data. So like, um, let's think about a murder case. So someone is convicted uh, or someone is accused rather of murder. And um, I'm looking forward to this. We're about to find beauty in a murder case. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on board. Well, 
No, I'm not. I'm not saying we're going to find beauty in the murder case. I'm just uh, using it as an example to show that you can combine something with a hypothesis that can get you to to an expectation. But then the question is going to be, well, well, why did you combine that with that hypothesis in the first place? Doesn't that seem out of place? So what you could do in the case of like, so suppose that someone is accused of murder, um, murdering their wife. Okay, but then once you look into the evidence, you find out that they've there's all of this evidence that shows that they were in a loving relationship. There is no reason that you can see no motivation that you can see that you can really tag onto this guy like from a probabilistic standpoint that makes it likely that he uh had some sort of motive to kill his wife okay from all the evidence that we see it looks like he loves his wife now the prosecutor could come and say well i'm just gonna say you know as as someone who believes that he's guilty i'm just gonna give this motive to him but that's super unlikely. And so you could, if you attach that motive to him, then that raises the likelihood that he is the killer because he's got a motive now. Um, but then the deeper question is, well, why do you think that he has that motive in the first place? And so applying it back to atheism and evolution, like why would you think that evolution would be expected given atheism? Like I already said, like I don't think evolution is actually going to explain like all of the beauty that we see in the world. But then why would you attach evolution to atheism in the first place? That just seems uh, really unlikely in itself. So it would almost be, um, it would it would sort of maybe change the, the dialogue. So instead of looking necessarily at, well, every case of beauty, we would just then look at some deeper question like, well, why do you think that, you know, evolution, why are you trying to pair atheism and evolution in the first place? That seems... Uh, pretty unlikely if atheism is true that there would be this world that has order to a degree that there are these uh, beings that can uh, evolve over time that there's these fundamental laws of nature that are consistent over millions of years like that all seems really wild and really unexpected if all that we know is that atheism is true and so you can again you can combine like theories if you want and just like come up with a toy theory but then it's another thing to like actually argue that that thing is likely like in the case of the the guy that that you know is being accused of murder like if it's just really unlikely like if it looks like he loved his wife then why would you try to like just make up a motive and attach that to him and like that's your theory mm -hmm. so that that's kind of like what uh how would i respond okay just to give my own response to that uh steel man version of dawkins i would say i agree that um evolution may not be able to explain all of the forms of beauty like you cited a sunset because why would humans find that why would humans find sunsets beautiful because it doesn't really affect our survival one way or another if we perceive them as beautiful there's also um the problem well in addition to that not not to kind of cut you off but just to sort of add to it maybe add something that i didn't explain before mm -hmm. is that even if you've got evolution that's not necessarily going to explain subjective conscious experiences of beauty and so mm -hmm. the evolution is really only about organisms it's about how this organism developed over time to develop into a more complex biological organism but it doesn't actually predict that there's going to be any conscious states attached to that thing or that they're going to be arranged in some way or have some sort of quality or phenomenology associated with that biological organism and so um the the again the phenomenon question here is subjective conscious experiences of beauty or you could either i guess either objective beauty that exists really in the world beside our conscious experiences of it or you could pinpoint you know, subjective experiences of beauty conscious experiences um, evolution is not going to explain that evolution is not going to provide a, an explanation of why there are conscious states of subjective beauty it may explain why you know organisms behave in certain ways but it's not going to give us this uh expectation of a subconscious experience mm -hmm. of something like beauty so just to kind of tag on to yeah. another reason to think that that explanation uh doesn't really do all the work that it needs to okay the second thing i'd point out is that um that evolution is consistent with theism and so a theist yes. can can perfectly well say yeah you're right we did evolve to find certain things beautiful but then that only raises the deeper question of why does evolution happen and and so that gets us into a version of the design argument or the contingency argument that's going to end up pointing back to god anyway so um even if you were to grant that all of our perceptions of beauty are 
evolutionarily conditioned. That doesn't do away with the question of why does evolution happen in the first place, and uh, and do you need a god to have a universe where evolution happens? I see that we have a couple of questions um, that I'll answer real quick before we move on. One of them is from uh, Die Bear, and she says, if I had Super Chat money, I would ask about the purple shirt. So I'll just answer that question. Uh, I took a tip from Jack Webb of Dragnet years and years ago when they were filming Dragnet he wore the same suit in every episode he had multiple copies of the suit and that way they never had a problem when cutting together video footage now that's not as much of a concern on YouTube but I just tend to wear the same shirt because people tell me I look good in purple with my red hair and so I wear purple shirts and people sometimes say do you have an infinite supply of purple shirts well if I did I would love that because it would allow me to demonstrate problems with the philosophical version of the Kalam argument. If I had an actual collection of infinite purple shirts, um, I could do live Hilbert's Hotel reenactments and stuff. But in fact, I have only a finite number of shirts. I just wash them. So for those who want to know. Um, also, I've actually got 15 uh -huh. pairs of this shirt. So. 15. Cool. Nice. And then we also have a question. Uh, here it is. It's from uh, Come Across. Is this live? Yes, this is live, at least at the time we're recording it. Maybe not at the time that you're watching it. So, uh, Cameron, anything else on the argument from Beauty, or you want to proceed to his next argument? Um, yeah, we can we can move on, because there's, there's, there's more to say in that section that I, I, I could just say now, but let's go ahead and read and then talk. Okay. So we're going to go back to this layout, and his next argument is the argument from personal experience, and he puts scare quotes around experience for some reason. He says, one of the cleverest and more mature of my undergraduate contemporaries, who was deeply religious, went camping in the Scottish Isles. In the middle of the night, he and his girlfriend were woken in their tent by the voice of the devil, Satan himself. There could be no possible doubt. The voice was in every sense diabolical. My friend would never forget this horrifying experience, and it was one of the factors that later drove him to be ordained. That's, inter that's an interesting turn of phrase. I'm, I'm not... Most people who get ordained, I don't know that they feel driven to it, but that's what he says. My useful self was impressed by this by his story, and I recounted it to a gathering of zoologists relaxing in the Rose and Crown Inn, Oxford. Two of them happened to be experienced ornithologists, and they roared with laughter. Manx Shearwater, they shouted in delighted chorus. One of them added that the diabolical shrieks and cackles of this species have earned it, in various parts of the world and various languages, the local nickname Devil Bird. Many people believe in God because they believe they've seen a vision of him, or an angel or a virgin in blue, with their own eyes. Or he speaks to them inside their heads. This argument from personal experience is the one that is most convincing to those who claim to have had one, but it is the least convincing to anyone else and anyone with a knowledge, anyone knowledgeable about psychology. You say you have experienced God directly? Well, some people have experienced a pink elephant, but that probably doesn't impress you. Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, distinctly heard the voice of Jesus telling him to kill women, and he was locked up for life. George W. Bush says that God told him to evade Iraq. A pity God didn't vouchsafe him a revelation that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Individuals in asylums think they are Napoleon or Charlie Chaplin or that the entire world is conspiring against them or that they can broadcast their thoughts into other people's heads. We humor them, but don't take their internally revealed beliefs seriously, mostly because not that many people share them. Um, so then we're about to head into a quote from Sam Harris, but uh, any thoughts on what he's written so far? No, I mean, it, it kind of mirrors his approach with the last argument where mm -hmm. he's attempting to, uh, well, in this one, he attempts to explain the religious experiences in terms of like psychology here. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can continue reading all I can, I can share more thoughts as, as okay. we go on. Yeah, uh, for me, you know, I think he has a point here that people can have subjective experiences that they're mistaken about, um, like, you know, interpreting the voice of the Manx Shearwater devil bird as the literal voice of the devil. That can happen. 
Um, similarly, and I, I'm I'm not I actually haven't been able to verify that the Yorkshire Ripper thought Jesus was telling him to kill women, although he did claim voices were telling him to kill people. Um, mm-hmm. My concern here, and also I have a different perspective on telepathy than he does, but um, he says, we humor them, but don't take their internally revealed beliefs seriously, mostly because not many people share them. And that's an argumentum ad populum. Most people don't believe something, so we should go with what most people say and and dismiss what other people say that's a sheer appeal to popularity argument and that's known as a logical fallacy which means it's unreliable doesn't mean it's always wrong just means it's unreliable as a way of getting to the truth and so i would not base my rejection of someone's claim to be napoleon or charlie chaplin on what most people think i would base it on other more objective evidence so i think he's going down a wrong path here with this popularity argument In any Mm. event, he says, religious experiences are different only in that the people who claim them are numerous. Okay, so he's just revealed a problem with his own argument, really, because it's going to fail based on if we're supposed to go with what's popular and religion is popular, then you ought to go with religion. Sam Harris was not being overly cynical when he wrote in The End of Faith, We have names for people who have many beliefs for which there is no rational justification. When their beliefs are extremely common, we call them religious. Otherwise, we are likely they are likely to be called mad, psychotic, or delusional. Clearly, there is sanity in numbers, and yet it is merely an accident of history that it is considered normal in our society to believe that the creator of the universe can hear your thoughts, while it is demonstrative of mental illness to believe that he is communicating with you by having the rain tap in Morse code on your bedroom window. And so, while religious people are not generally mad, their core beliefs absolutely are. And then he says, I shall return to the subject of hallucinations in chapter 10. He then has a notable discussion of um, of how our brains process sensory information. He says, the human brain runs first-class simulation software. Our eyes don't process don't present to our brains a faithful photograph of what is out there or an accurate movie of what is going on through time. Our brains construct a continuously updated model, updated by coded pulses chattering along the optic nerve, but constructed nevertheless. Optical illusions are vivid reminders of this. A major class of illusions, of which the Necker cube is an example, arise because the sense data that the brain receives are compatible with two alternative models of reality. The brain, having no basis for choosing between them, alternates, and we experience a series of flips from one internal model to the other. The picture we are looking at appears almost literally to flip over and become something else. And just so that folks have, uh, if you're not familiar with the Necker Cube, this is what it is. This is a Necker Cube. And you can look at it a couple of different ways. There, there, You can look at it as protruding one face, one square towards you with the other major square in the background, or you can look at it the other way so that the Necker Cube either points towards your left or towards your right and you can by thinking about it make the perspective flip back and forth so that's what he's talking about when he's talking about a necker cube but back to what he says The simulation software in the brain is especially adept at constructing faces and voices. I have on my windowsill a plastic mask of Einstein. When seen from the front, it looks like a solid face, not surprisingly. What is surprising is that when seen from behind, the hollow side, it looks like a solid face, and our perception of it is very odd indeed. As the viewer moves around, the face seems to follow, and not in the weak, unconvincing sense that the Mona Lisa's eyes are said to follow you. The hollow mask really, really looks as though it is moving. People who haven't previously seen the illusion gasp with amazement. Even stranger, if the mask is mounted on a slowly rotating turntable, it appears to turn in the correct direction when you are looking at the solid side, but in the opposite direction when the hollow side comes into view. 
The result is that when you watch the transition from one side to the other, the upcoming side appears to eat the going side. It is a stunning illusion, well worth going to some trouble to see. Sometimes you can get surprisingly close to the hollow face and still not see that it is really hollow. When you do see it, again, there is a sudden flip which may be reversible. Why does it happen? There is no trick in the construction of the mask. Any hollow mask will do it. The trickery is all in the brain of the beholder. The internal simulating software receives data indicating the presence of a face, perhaps nothing more than a pair of eyes, a nose, and a mouth in approximately the right places. Having received these sketchy clues, the brain does the rest. The face simulation software kicks into action and it constructs a fully solid model of a face, even though the reality presented to the eyes is a hollow mask. The illusion of rotation in the wrong direction comes about because, it's quite hard, but if you think through it carefully, you will confirm it, reverse rotation is the only way to make sense of the optical data when a hollow mask rotates while being perceived to be a solid mask. It is like the illusion of a rotating radar dish that you sometimes see at airports until the brain flips to the correct model of the radar dish, an incorrect model is seen rotating in the wrong direction, but in a weirdly cockeyed way. I say all this, finally he gets to the point, I say all this to demonstrate the formidable power of the brain simulation software. It is well capable of constructing visions and visitations of the utmost veridical power, and I'm going to want to come back to that word, veridical. Uh, to simulate a ghost or an angel or a Virgin Mary would be child's play to software this sophistication. And the same thing works for hearing. When we hear a sound, it is not faithfully transported up the auditory nerve and relayed to the brain as if by a high fidelity, fidelity bang and Olufsen. As with vision, the brain constructs a sound model based on continuously updated auditory nerve data. That is why we hear a trumpet blast as a single note rather than as the composite of pure tone harmonics that gives it its brassy snarl. A clarinet playing the same note sounds woody and an oboe sounds reedy because of different balances of harmonics. If you carefully manipulate a sound synthesizer to bring in the separate harmonics one by one, the brain hears them as a combination of pure tones for a short while until its simulation software gets it, and from then on we perceive only a single note of pure trumpet or oboe or whatever it is. The vowels and consonants of speech are constructed in the brain in the same kind of way, and so, at another level, are higher order phonemes and words. Okay, so that's the end of this section. Uh, any thoughts on that, Cameron? Nope. Okay, I would uh, I would agree. I mean, his basic description of how we cognitively, uh, mentally, well, how our brains process sensory data is correct. You know, he's not saying anything wrong about the sensory data. But um, when he says at the top of this page that the that. It, our brains are capable of constructing visions and visitations of the utmost veridical power. Um, depending on what you mean, that's true. We can produce convincing illusions of things that are not there, as evidenced by the fact we dream. You know, when most people dream, and this isn't everybody, because there are people who dream in different ways, but when most people dream, they have a fully realistic illusion around them. And there, something in their brain is conjuring that up. You know, something in their subconscious is is manufacturing the dreams that we have. Um, but that here he's using the word veridical to mean convincing. And there's another sense of the word veridical um, in parapsychology. Veridical information is information that a person did not have any natural way of knowing that is specific enough, it couldn't be guessed by random chance, and it turns out to be true. So those are the three characteristics of vertical knowledge. You had no natural way of knowing it, it's specific enough, it couldn't be guessed by random chance, and yet it turns out to be true. And so I would agree with Dawkins if someone just says, I saw the Virgin Mary or God you know, revealed himself to me and gave me a powerful awareness of his presence. Well, I'd say, okay, that's very interesting. Tell me about it. But I wouldn't really be in much of a position to pass judgment on was this a genuine experience or was it, was it a hallucination? 
it could could be either one potentially but if someone says god revealed himself to me or the virgin mary or whoever and they told me that the following things are going to occur next week and then the following things which are specific enough you couldn't just guess them do occur next week i would say that gives me evidence that this was that this was a veridical experience it was a genuine experience of god or the virgin mary or whoever if it's accompanied by veridical information and that's something that and the more vertical information you got with an experience the more evidence you have that this was an actual experience of the supernatural rather than just a hallucination and this is something that dawkins completely ignores he he doesn't interact with this at all in this section the idea that there could be veridical information accompanying a religious experience is something that is not even on his radar so yeah i think that's mm-hmm. i think that's important and then he also doesn't address at least i haven't seen and, and maybe he does talk about it at some point you, you would probably know this but i didn't see him address the the question of whether or not there would would a religious experience involving a group of people would that be evidence for, ah. for theism or anything like that does he address group he he does experiences he, he does get to that yes okay um so let's let's proceed uh, he says, once as a child, I heard a ghost, a male voice murmuring as if in recitation or prayer. I could almost, but not quite, make out the words, which seemed to have a serious, solemn timber. I had been told stories of priest holes in ancient houses, and I was a little frightened. And for people who may not be aware, what a priest hole is, is it's a hiding place that hiding places were built in Catholic households in England after the Reformation, because Catholics were persecuted and priests could get executed if they were caught in the country. So what they would do is they would bring priests in secretly to minister to the faithful, and then they had these hiding places known as priest holes, where if the Protestant authorities were starting to crash in on the house, you could just put the priest in the priest hole and he could wait it out there. And this is why you see a lot of fiction where British old British houses have secret passages and stuff like that. That was how you got to the priest hole. So that's what he's referring to there. Americans frequently don't know about priest holes, but that's what he's referring to. So he says, um, I, but I got out of bed and crept up on the sound of the, on, on the source of the sound. As I got closer, it grew louder, and then suddenly it flipped inside my head. I was now close enough to discern what it really was. The wind gusting through the keyhole was creating sounds which the simulation software in my brain had used to construct a model of male speech, solemnly intoned. Had I been a more impressionable child, it is possible that I would have heard not just unintelligible speech, but particular words and even sentences. And had I been brought up both impressionable and had I been both impressionable and religiously brought up, I wonder what the words the wind might have spoken. On another occasion, when I was about the same age, I saw a giant round face gazing with unspeakable malevolence out through the window of an otherwise ordinary house in a seaside village. In trepidation, I approached until I was close enough to see what it really was, just a vaguely face-like pattern created by the chance fall of the curtains. The face itself and its evil mien had been constructed in my fearful child's brain. On September 11, 2001, pious people thought that they saw the face of Satan in the smoke rising from the Twin Towers, a superstition backed by a photograph which was published on the internet and widely circulated. So those are just a couple, few anecdotes. Constructing models is something the human brain is very good at. When we are asleep, it is called dreaming. When we are awake, we call it imagination, or when it is exceptionally vivid, hallucination. As chapter 10 will show, children who have imaginary friends sometimes see them clearly, exactly as if they were real. If we are gullible, we don't recognize hallucination or lucid dreaming, I'm going to come back to that term, for what it is, and we claim to have seen or heard a ghost or an angel or God, or especially if we happen to be young female and Catholic, the Virgin Mary. Such visions and manifestations are certainly not good grounds for believing that ghosts or angels, gods or virgins are actually there. 
So I have a few thoughts about that. But first, Cameron, do you have any? No, I'm. I'll save my thoughts for once we okay. uh, once we finish this section. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not sure what's going on here when he refers to lucid dreaming. He says that if we are gullible, we don't recognize lucid dreaming for what it is. And what lucid dreaming is is when you know you're dreaming, and um, you know you you may. Uh, I, different people have different amounts of lucid dreaming, but the definition of lucid dreaming is you're dreaming and you become lucid. You become aware of the fact this is a dream. And I have that fairly frequently. Uh, sometimes I become aware of it without just by thinking about what's going on in the dream. And I think this is improbable. I think this is a dream. Other times I deduce it where I'm presented with things in a dream and I realize this doesn't make any sense logically, therefore I must be in a dream right now. And some people are trained to, um, to dream lucidly. Uh, one common technique is you, if you see your hands in a dream, it is a cue and you have to learn this so it becomes a habit. But if you see your hands in a dream, it becomes a cue to ask yourself, am I really dreaming or not? And that moment of reflection can cause you to notice things that tell you you're in a dream. And then once you are lucid, you may be able to affect the course of the dream. Uh, for example, if it was a really scary dream, you may be able to redirect it in such a way that it's not scary anymore. So I don't know what he's talking about in terms of not recognizing lucid dreaming for what it is, because lucid dreaming, by definition, is recognized. It's something that's recognized. He then, on the basis of these anecdotes that he's spun, says that uh, such visions or manifestations are certainly not good grounds for believing that ghosts or angels, gods, or virgins are actually there. And I would agree that by themselves, they're not. But as a paranormal investigator, I'm trained to look, take an experience report. Like, let's say someone says there's a ghost in my house. I take down all the different phenomena that they report happening, including their subjective perceptions and anything else that's more objective. Then I make a list of all the possible explanations that could explain the reports, including the natural explanations. And I start with the natural explanations because natural phenomena are more common than paranormal phenomena. And I see, I, I use a process of elimination. I see do I have evidence that would support any of the natural explanations? And if none of, the, none of the natural explanations work, then that, by process of elimination, as Sherlock Holmes says, once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth, that would give me evidence that something paranormal is going on. And so someone could genuinely have an experience of a ghost or an angel or a god or a virgin or whatever it may be. It's just the experience report itself is not enough. But if you put that experience report in the context of what's going on in this location and you say, could anything else explain it? And the answer is no, then you do have evidence for a paranormal experience. And an, mm -hmm. example, an example of something in context would be veridical information. Like if you say um, a ghost showed up and it told me where there was buried treasure, and then we go and we dig it up and there is buried treasure there. Well, okay, that's evidence this was more than just a normal experience, that something paranormal happened here. Um, Cameron. Yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, he's almost... I mean, listening to to you talk has has sort of helped me formulate my my own thoughts here. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it seems like, in general, his approach is argue that the process is fallible, and he gives you know various anecdotes for that, and then talks about other things, um, and then there's the, the sort of the way that the brain can produce false positives, and then on that basis, wants to argue that they're all mm -hmm. like none of them are are real, yeah. um, and that that seems to be you know, something, a conclusion that is not warranted by the evidence. Just because some process is fallible, that doesn't mean that every experience is uh, therefore going to to be fake or whatever, you know? And and I think that's that's the conclusion that he draws at the end of the section we just read. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the, the argumentation seems to be lacking there. I mean, in, in all that it would take to respond, 
respond to him or, or combat that would be to look at an at an actual case because he he gave some anecdotes of false positives and stuff. But then you'd in your case, like you would want to look at a real case where we have this you know, ostensible or, or alleged. Uh, what did you call it? Veridical knowledge? Yeah. So, something like along, along those lines, like look at one of those cases and then ask the question, what is the best explanation of this? Would it be some sort of internal thing happening in a brain or would it be, or would the best explanation be that something is happening externally to this person? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If one, if, if he framed the argument in terms of the processes by which our brains perceive the world are fallible, you could, and therefore, all of these experiences are, that people report are mistaken. You could, um, you could turn that around on them and say, then how do you have any knowledge of the external world? Because you could just as easily say, well, then all of your perceptions of the external world are mistaken. You know, we need some criterion to distinguish between experience. We we agree that the process of in, of perceiving the world is fallible. So we need some criterion for distinguishing between um, perceptions that are accurate and perceptions that are inaccurate. And so far, the only thing he's proposed is popularity. But then yeah, he, he, here's a, here's maybe mm-hmm. sorry to kind of cut you off. Sure. Uh, here, here's maybe another way of uh, or another maybe example, and it's somewhat related to experiences of the external world. External world would be. Uh, your own private memory experiences. And what I mean by private memory experiences are memories that you have while you're alone. So there's no one else there. If you had breakfast on your own, um, whatever you did by yourself that you can't verify by asking someone else that was there at the time. And then the first step would be in order to make it a sort of corollary of Richard's argument, Dr. Dawkins' argument, is that you got to recognize that your memory is fallible. Everyone's memory is fallible. But then in this case, you don't have anyone else that you can talk to and be like, hey, did you see this as well? Um, but but nevertheless, I think we have a lot of private knowledge about our, our, our own memory states, you know, things that we remember, that we experience. We can't go out and verify, um, uh, in a lot of cases, like something that you ate. You can't go and, like, look in a trash can and, and try to figure out, you know, what you ate back then. You just got to rely. Think about, okay, what did I eat? You remember it, and then on that basis, you form the belief, okay, yeah, this that, that's what I ate, and that this is my memory gives me a knowledge about, you know, s- some fact uh, about reality. And you know, and so, yeah, I think that's another uh, another example to help show the point that you you can't just argue from fallibility to none of this stuff is real. And if you did that, you're just uh, like you said, it's just going to sort of open a can of worms of skepticism. You're just going to have to be skeptical of a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of stuff. I think way more than someone like Dawkins would would want to admit. You know, I don't think he wants to be skeptical of all of his private memories, um, but this sort of argumentation might lead him to, to do that, so. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's continue on then, because this here is where he gets to uh, collective experiences. Um, okay. He says, on the face of it, mass visions, such as the report that 70,000 pilgrims at Fatima in Portugal in 1917 saw the sun tear itself from the heavens and come crashing down upon the multitude, are harder to write off. So he acknowledges that collective experiences are harder to write off. He says it is not easy to explain how 70,000 people could share the same hallucination, but it is even harder to accept that it really, and here he's, he's, he's veering off into a straw man, but it is even harder to accept that it really happened without the rest of the world outside of Fatima seeing it too, and not just seeing it, but feeling it as the catastrophic destruction of the solar system, including acceleration forces sufficient to hurl everybody into space. David Hume's pithy test for a miracle comes irresistibly to mind. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. It may seem improbable that 70,000 people could simultaneously be deluded or could simultaneously collude in a mass lie, or that history is mistaken in recording that 70,000 people claimed to see the sun dance, or that they all simultaneously saw a mirage. They had been persuaded to stare at the sun, which could have done 
which can't have done much for their eyesight. But any of those apparent improbabilities is far more probable than the alternative, that the Earth was suddenly yanked sideways in, his or- in its orbit and the solar system destroyed with nobody out- outside Fatima noticing. I mean, Portugal is not that isolated. This is really all that needs to be said about personal experiences of God or other religious phenomena. If you've had such an experience, you may well find yourself believing firmly that it was real, but don't expect the rest of us to take your word for it, especially if we have the slightest familiarity with the brain and its powerful workings. So, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I had all my thoughts organized, and now they're they're not coming back to me as, <laughs> as organized as I'd like. Um, but overall, it seems like the the approach, again, he wants to, sort of similar with, uh, well, your steel man of his argument against beauty, mm-hmm. is that he you appealed to evolution in order to explain uh, beauty in the world and stuff. And here it seems like he's wanting to explain all religious experiences based on the brain, right? Mm-hmm. And so if we understand, if we really know what the brain is all about and how it works, then we can explain all of the personal experiences that people have of uh, you know their religious experiences if they've seen uh, the Virgin Mary or whatever else or if they feel like they've experienced God or seen a ghost or seen a demon or whatever else then then we can explain everything if we just appeal to the brain and to me it's like it, it almost doesn't even matter like it, why why are we trying to do this why are we why are you even pointing to the brain I think what he wants to do is say that the brain is ultimately the best explanation for it and therefore we don't need to invoke God and th- there's a couple thoughts that I've got on that. So first of all, the brain hypothesis is not inconsistent with theism. That's similar to the point that you made, Jimmy, in the last one with respect to beauty and your steel man of it is that evolution is not necessarily incompatible with theism. And so, yeah, our brains producing these false positives and stuff like that's compatible with theism. And so you've got to point to some hypothesis that is inconsistent with theism. And so you'd have to basically combine atheism with that hypothesis but then it goes back to the point that I was making earlier in the in the, the earlier section on beauty is that how likely is it that we have these brains that can produce these fallible mental states about you know, these experiences of ghosts and demons and angels and everything else? How likely is that given atheism? Seems pretty unlikely. Seems like there's absolutely zero reason to expect a world in which there are conscious beings that can have these sorts of subjective experiences or that there's some sort of evolutionary process that would produce beings that have these capabilities and stuff and so it seems to me like the the question is still going to like it's going to come down to this deeper question of what is the best explanation of reality we're comparing atheism and theism which one of these actually better predicts the data so what all these subjective experiences of beauty and religious experience which hypothesis better better predicts that data to, to, to see it in the world. And theism, I think, has a much better chance of producing something like that. Whereas atheism, like there's, um, again, there's no reason to expect a world with that has these natural laws, that has an orderly universe, that has um, these fine-tuned parameters that where, where life is possible in a universe like ours. And so, yeah, I think the uh, the deeper question is, is still not really even being addressed here. So, even if he's right that the brain is fallible. A, that's not incompatible with theism. Theism also predicts something like that. And then also, on top of that, I guess, um, I, I don't think I made this point yet, but what you mentioned is that there are some religious experiences that can't be explained simply in terms of brain states. And so, you'd have to address those, which he doesn't. And then, the deeper question is still, you know, which hypothesis ultimately explains all this stuff? And I don't think he's uh, really doing a good job of, of arguing that, that atheism it has any sort of probabilistic or explanatory upper hand here. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that occurs to me um, in reading his argument here about Fatima is he's he's engaging in a ridiculous straw man. Um, now this is your comments, Cameron, were more on a meta level dealing with his argument. Mine is more specific to this particular argument, but it's what he uses as an example. Nobody. Yeah, and this is. I'll just say, kind of explain a little bit more about it um, really quickly. When I when I read a section like this, and I'm like, okay, well, what are the real implications of this? Yeah. Like, there's like what you're about to do, Jimmy, is you're about to look at his actual individual arguments and be like, well, 
actually what he argues here doesn't even um doesn't even really compute but what i'm looking at like given the best case scenario like even if his argument goes through and and it is does it it does kind of come down to as he says the brain and its powerful workings Mm -hmm. how does that actually give us any reason to think that atheism is true over theism and so that's where my mind ultimately goes i'm like even if all this is true like what does that give us and in my view it just doesn't give us much and so that that's kind of hopefully that explains a little bit like why i'm not looking at the details like uh, like jimmy is here but i'm nevertheless mm-hmm. interested in what you got to say yeah no we're we both are doing the same thing i mean we both look at individual arguments and then say and what can we generalize from this unfortunately he doesn't do the he doesn't really spell out his logic for us on the on the larger level and so you know we're we're kind of having to guess a little bit exactly what his reasoning is um but it's it's weak you know you can't go from these could be mistaken to these must be mistaken mm-hmm. that's just that's an invalid inference um but just so people are aware that uh that his e- even his particular argument here is lame because no catholics claim the solar system fell apart in 1917 um, you know that is that is not the belief of 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 people who support the apparitions at Fatima. Um, instead, they would say that people in Fatima had an experience in October of 1917 where they perceived the sun to behave in an unusual way in the sky, and there were lots of people there who had this perception. Um, In terms of what it was, though, nobody claims it was a destruction of the solar system. Instead, people will interpret it either as a subjective vision that many people were granted or as an optical phenomenon uh, that was providentially caused. um, in, In This is a position that Father Stanley Yaki, for example, has proposed, that there were weather phenomena there that were providentially used at the right moment to give people this experience. So it may have been purely subjective, it may have been uh, partially objective, but nobody claims it involved the destruction of the solar system. And so um, Dawkins is tilting at a windmill here. You know, he's he's this is a ridiculous straw man. Nobody in the Catholic Church claims this is what happened. And so he's he's just attacking a false target. So that's what I'd have to say about that. um, That particular argument that he brings up. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's it's sort of indicative of his his overall approach, which is to just be very uncharitable Mm -hmm. toward the religious uh, argumentation or or what they've said in response. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's unfortunate. I mean, yeah, I mean, th- th- this is this is why a lot of the uh, atheist philosophers don't really recommend his God Delusion book because mm-hmm. it's not not a very serious philosophical work. Yeah. So that doesn't mean it's not a popular work that doesn't deserve discussion, though, which is why we're talking about it because it is an extremely Correct. popular work. Correct. And it, I mean, I, I'm sure that some people reading it have, have read it and been like, uh, yeah, you know what? That's a really good point. Like, I, I didn't know how to think about that. And so hopefully this is providing some value to people to help to see you guys, uh, help to teach you guys how to, to analyze things at a deeper level. Yeah. So before we move on to the next section, I see we've got some questions that have come in. And if you want to ask a question, please put a Q in front of it, a Q colon, so we know it's a question for us. Uh, The Last Freibender says, do you believe the criteria for assessing the paranormal slash supernatural slash divine activity or intervention has a higher bar today than 2,000 years ago? Well, um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I would say that if I were transported 2,000 years in the past, I would apply the same criteria that I use today um, in evaluating such things. So I don't think in that sense there is a difference. However, in terms of did people 2,000 years ago apply the same standard that I would apply today, I think that would depend on the person. There were There were different you know, groups of people in the past, some were more credulous, some were more skeptical, just like there are more credulous people today and more skeptical people today. So Mm -hmm. I think fundamentally, you know, I have an advantage in that I know because of the scientific revolution, I know more science than than someone 2000 years ago would have known. And so I'm in a better position to analyze um, certain natural causes 
that they may not have been aware of that could explain something. But but fundamentally, I would say that the criteria are the same. It's just a question of how much base knowledge are you bringing to the situation when you're analyzing it. And beyond that, it's a matter of individuals and what criteria they personally use. Any yeah, I think the that? deeper question... Yeah, I think the deeper question here is like, what, how, how do we get at the truth? Like, how was it easier back then? Is it easier now? That's, that's maybe kind of like the, the idea behind this. Like, was it, e is it easier now to get to the truth? We have different types of evidence we can evaluate. We can, you know, there's video evidence, there's photography evidence, there's, uh, um, scientific evidence and back then we just didn't have really access to that and so are we in a better position now that we uh you know living 2000 and uh, 2000 years in the future as, as opposed to the 2000 years ago are we in a better position now to get at the truth of the matter and i think um in some cases the answer is yes or in some ways the answer is yes in some ways the answer is no mm -hmm. um I, I think we were probably in a better position actually probably in the uh the late 21st century but now with the invention of the internet i think it's actually kind of going the opposite way and especially with the invention of ai things are actually going to start to take a downturn so in terms of our ability to assess the truth of things like i mean just for example like i i spend um maybe 30 minutes a day just kind of perusing uh twitter or x and just trying to see like what's out there what people are talking about see if i can get any ideas for some new content on capturing christianity and like most of what i see is uh, conspiracy theories like that's what sort of x has kind of turned into or is like it, it's not that we don't have these tools anymore it's that we have too many tools we have so many tools that people can make up all sorts of different conspiracy theories to explain what they're seeing and so it's almost like created more confusion and, cre and made a more difficult situation to actually get at the truth so what, are we better off now than we were then i don't know like i think i think things are actually going to start to go backwards and i mean even I think in the beginning of like the 2000s and stuff, people were already kind of noticing that the internet has provided this sort of false sense of confidence. Like you, you have a question about something, you're able to Google it, and then the first thing that pops up might automatically or like that that, that thing kind of confirms what you already were, were kind of wanting to believe going into it and so that's like what you're just going to end up believing you might even just read a headline of some title you know the title of a blog post and then on that basis just believe whatever thing you were looking into and that is not really the way to actually get at truth you want to look at primary sources you want to look at people that are uh, talking about this from both angles and be as unbiased as possible um, but in a lot of cases, like the internet and the access to information doesn't have the result that we'd like it to have. We'd like it to, to produce more truth uh, than falsehood, but it, it unfortunately, I don't think it actually works that way, uh, practically yeah. speaking. So, And that's why I created Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Uh, Jamaican Jerk says, is it fair to say that most religious people have to do cognitive dissonance when comparing secular history to biblical history, for example? And he mentions examples of Darius the Mede being fictional and also the Exodus. Um, Cameron, you want to address that first or would you like me to? Um, most religious people have to do cognitive dissonance. Or I'm not sure what he means by have ex experience. To do it. They have to deal okay. with cognitive dis dissonance, or they experience cognitive dissonance. Um, mm. I would say that uh, I think that there is cognitive dissonance that one encounters, whether um, religious or not, when you have one claim that you've heard, and then you enc you encounter a counterclaim. Cognitive dissonance can result and will result if you take both possibilities seriously. Now, cognitive dissonance won't result if you dismiss one of the possibilities. So if you have someone who hears the exodus happened and the exodus didn't happen, if they just dismiss one of those possibilities, like if a religious person says, oh, of course it happened, well, then they're not going to have they're not going to have cognitive dissonance. Or if a, a non-believer hears the exodus happened, they're going to, and they say, oh, of course it didn't. Well, then they're not going to have cognitive dissonance. But for anybody who, who takes both claims seriously and says, which one of these is true, they can't both be true, 
then you're going to experience cognitive dissonance. And it doesn't matter whether you're coming at it religiously or non-religiously. Um, it's the it, it's it's not your background beliefs that are the determinative here. It's the contrary nature of the two propositions you encounter and your willingness to consider them both that produces the cognitive dissonance. Mm-hmm. You, I, 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 I would camera? just say... Yeah, in response to the way that he's actually framing it here, is it fair to say that most religious people have or experience cognitive dissonance? I would say the answer to that is probably no. Like, most people don't even really think too deeply or consider secular history or what secular historians are are saying on these matters. So, Mm -hmm. uh, the answer, I think, would be no. So, you'd have to be more specific and say uh, maybe most thinking religious people, people that consider the the truth of the matter about these, do they experience cognitive dissonance? And I would say, I would, I would say probably a large majority of them do. They experience some sort of cognitive dissonance. Um, but then as you pointed out, Jimmy, like that's going to happen across the board. Like people who are thinking like you're going to come up against stuff that causes cognitive dissonance and you're going to have to deal with it in various ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen it. Um, we, we've been talking more about the mirac- miraculous on capturing Christianity, mm-hmm. and I'm seeing a lot of cognitive dissonance on the part of uh, secularists who are mm-hmm. coming at these, and, and the, the comments that they're leaving, they're, they're not even attempting to explain what is being testified to in these interviews and stuff. They're just literally coming and expressing incredulity. They might talk about how silly it is, and they might um, just kind of brush it off and hand wave it away. And uh, to me, that's a form of cognitive dissonance. And so I think it, it's going to apply to uh, to anyone. It just depends on what the subject matter is and their level of uh, openness to to being wrong. Or uh, and I think also kind of what you said, Jimmy. Like there's there's different sort of authorities that people will recognize, and some people will. Um, hold the view that the Bible is ultimately authoritative and then everything under that, like we don't even need to consider it. Like we don't even need to care about what secular historians have to say because their authority, uh, it's, it's almost non-existent in comparison to how authoritative the Bible is. But mm-hmm. Yeah. Just yeah. to add a little bit more. So Darius the Mede is something I haven't looked at uh, in detail recently, so I won't comment on that at the moment. But I have looked at the Exodus and whether it happened, and actually we've got some good evidence for the ex- Exodus. Um, I actually did an episode of Mysterious World on that. It's episode 166, 166. So uh, Jamaican Jerk, if you want to check out uh, a discussion of whether the Exodus happened and the evidence uh, that it did, I conclude it did happen. Um it, it, then go to mysterious.fm slash 166 or just here on my YouTube channel, uh, type in Exodus and that video will come up. I did an episode on that too with did the guy. A, uh, actually, he's a, he's a Jewish philosopher. Yeah, he uh-huh. gave an interesting argument oh, for the cool. reality of it. Yeah, it, it was more of a philosophical argument based on the tradition mm-hmm. sort of being maintained through a culture over mm-hmm. time. And how that the fact that it's maintains for thousands of years actually provides some evidence that it actually happened. Did he also appeal to the criterion of embarrassment? Um, I, I don't recall. I don't think so. I think his his argument was mm-hmm. was uh, mainly a sort of philosophical approach to okay. uh, yeah the I'll, belief sort of being ingrained in the culture over time. Mm-hmm. I'll have to check that out. That sounds interesting. Uh, Let's see. Reed Richards, um, Mr. Fantastic himself, says, Why is the Prince of Lies allowed to physically attack people like Veronica Giuliani, Padre Pio, etc.? Well, this would be a subcase of the problem of evil. And um, I know that Cameron and I have both done a lot of work on the problem of evil. I've got uh, specifically a talk here on my YouTube channel about the problem of suffering. It's called If, If God Exists, Why Do I Suffer? And this would be a version of the suffering argument. So you can look that up. But um, just to give you my perspective in capsule form, um, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, God would not permit any evil to happen unless he would bring he was going to bring about an equal or greater good through that evil. And so if the devil attacks various people physically, God will ultimately bring about an equal or greater good, and it's for the sake of that good that he allows the physical evil to happen. Any thoughts, Cameron? Yeah, um, I don't want to get too deep into it. As you say, we've 
we've yeah. done a whole lot of work on this. Um, my my overall approach these days to the problem of evil is to um, sort of back out and take a sort of meta analysis, or try to try to get like an overall picture as, as best as we can, and ask some of the deeper questions like, what type of world in general would God want to create? And I think um, pretty much everyone would agree that God wants to create the best world that He can. And then the question is, well, what type of things would be included in this world? And that's when you're going to get down to uh, uh, a deeper question of what's called axiology in philosophy, which is the the value of different states. And so, um, Jimmy, you and, and a lot of other Christian philosophers have mentioned that there's these various goods that are just like the um, uh, moral freedom, the ability to choose between good and evil, uh, morally significant freedom, like that's a great good. And then if you want to include that in your world, then you've got to allow the possibility of them to do wrong in the world, whatever creatures that you end up creating in that world. And so that's going to kind of be some sort of explanation as to why there's these evil things like people attacking other people um, out of their own free will, which would also apply if there are such things as demons or Satan, those things attacking other people, that's still a sort of case of free will. And, um, and so then it really does come down to the deeper question of what are the greatest goods if God is uh, sort of obligated in some some sense, if God is going to create uh, the best world that he can, what sort of features would that world have? And uh, that's a deeper question I'd like everyone to think about. And it, ultimately, I think it points to theism and points to uh, the problem of evil actually sort of being reconciled in theism. Um, but but yeah, I'll, I'll end it there. Okay. Uh, Comacross says, do you think that Martin Luther's Protestant revolution was aided by demonic forces? Um, so this is a touchy one, um, but what I would say is that I think demonic forces are involved in all segments of human society. And so were demons involved in Protestant circles? Yes. Were demons also involved in Catholic circles? Yes. Were demons involved in Muslim circles? Yes. Were demons involved in Jewish circles? Yes. Were demons involved in secular circles? Yes. Uh, I don't think anybody has a monopoly on, 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 on being influenced by demons. I think all of us are subject to temptation, and demons are jerks that want to cause trouble. And so they cause trouble in every community, and I don't think we can uniquely attribute any movement in human history to being free of demonic influence. And so if you want to decide, you know, which movements have a better view of reality or a better view of the Christian faith, you're going to have to do that on separate grounds, but nobody is immune from demonic influence and they they'll play both sides against each other and cause problems with both sides. Yeah, so, I, I think that's mm -hmm. also uh, something that we should expect if mm -hmm. Christianity is true. Yep. Um, especially if there are such things as as demons. I mean, I, what, what was it? C.S. Lewis. I can't remember the exact quote uh, when he discusses that one of the, one of the smartest things that Satan has done is try to convince us that he doesn't exist. And I think that's. I mean, it, once you start to discount that hypothesis, I think we can get into some really uh, bad ground. We've got to remember that. I mean, we, we've got to sort of expand our um, pool of of hypotheses and understand what's going on in the world where why are people making these sorts of decisions why are various thoughts popping in their brains how can we uh, adequately adequately start start to address these things and um just pretending that we can exclude an entire possibility just because we're maybe uncomfortable with it or it's going to make us look silly like that's i think um not the prudent thing to do i'll put it that way it's not very uh wise it's not going to really help the people if there is something that is ultimately going on behind the scenes but yeah anyways okay we're going to take one more question then i think we need to go back to reading dawkins for his next section um game fan says how can you prove the mind exists outside of the physical brain well, um, so there are a variety of types of experiences that have been documented in parapsychology, and thus far I've done episodes on all of them on Mysterious World. Uh, the types of experiences that tend to, that do this most directly are ones where the conscious, where the physiological processes that sustain conscious thought are offline. So if someone has a, uh, uh, has cardiac arrest, so their heart is no longer pumping blood. 
then they will go unconscious within a few seconds. You know, it's like less than 30 seconds, they will be unconscious. And yet, if they're in a state of cardiac arrest and continue to have conscious experiences or what are called near-death experiences, then that would be evidence that the mind can function without the brain. Another would be after-death communications, where the person's not only in cardiac arrest, they're planted in the ground, and yet they show up and may provide veridical information. There are also uh, states where um, someone is near death and there's some evidence, it's not as conclusive, but there is some evidence of the brain kind of shaking loose from being encumbered by the body. And experiences like this include terminal lucidity and uh, deathbed visions. And so if you're interested in those, here on my channel, look up terminal lucidity, deathbed visions, near-death experiences, and after-death communications. And you'll get a whole bunch of resources with evidence tending in that direction. Now, that's an evidential approach to the mind being independent of the physical brain. But there are other approaches too, including philosophical approaches. Uh, Cameron, would you like to say anything about that? Uh, no, I think that's sufficient. I mean, I'm not a, an expert in d a dualism or mm -hmm. uh, any of those topics related to uh, philosophy of mind. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'll sit this one out. I'll let okay. you take that one. Yeah, in, I felt pretty confident in what you said. Okay. In that case, let's go back over to Richard Dawkins and see what further enlightening things he has to say to us. So here we go. The argument from Scripture. There are still some people who are persuaded by scriptural evidence to believe in God. A common argument attributed, among others, to C.S. Lewis, who should have known better, states that since Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, he must have either been right or else insane or a liar, mad, bad, or God, or with artless alliteration, lunatic, liar, or Lord. The historical evidence that Jesus claimed to any sort of divine status is minimal. But even if that evidence were good, the trilemma offered would be ludicrously inadequate. A fourth possibility, almost too obvious to need mentioning, is that Jesus was honestly mistaken. Plenty of people are. In any case, as I said, there is no good historical evidence that he ever thought he was divine. Okay. So, <laughs> you, I, I suspect you and I are both thinking similar things. So, uh, why don't you go first, Cameron? Uh, oh, can, can you pull it back up? Because oh, sure, uh, sure, there's, sure. There's a couple lines that I wanted to to read again. Yeah, there we Man, go. Man, just the like the unbridled condescension for no reason. Like C.S. Lewis was awesome. Mm -hmm. Who should have known better? Okay, first of all, I think in a debate between C.S. Lewis and Richard Dawkins, I think. Uh, C.S. Lewis would wipe the floor with him, first of all. Um, then he says, states that since Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, he must have neither uh, either been right or else insane or liar. Um, mad, bad, or God, or with artless alliteration. That's yeah. artless, liar, lunatic, Lord. Uh, no, I think that's great. Like, <laughs> why is he trying to... Uh, the, the condescension is so unnecessary and it's it's almost like he's uh personally insulted for some reason i don't i, don't, I where where is this coming from would be my next question like why is dawkins so um butthurt about this i, I don't get it hmm. okay <laughs> Well, um, one thing that I would say is Dawkins is mistaken in the claim that there's no evidence that Jesus, or very little evidence that Jesus claimed to be divine. There's actually a lot. Um, but it's both in Paul's epistles, which testify to a high Christology where Jesus is clearly regarded as God, and Paul even says he's God multiple times, and then in the Gospels. So that's evidence of early Christian belief in the divinity of Jesus. But then in the Gospels, he, in m several different ways, identifies himself as God. Um, now, it's not always using the term God, but he he does it in several different ways, as competent scholars have noted. But um, D Dawkins's fourth possibility doesn't work, because the way C.S. Lewis constructs this argument, he, he notes that if Jesus claimed to be God, well, okay, he was either he was either right about that, that's the Lord option, or he was deluded about that, 
And it, you, people just don't think that they're God or the Son of God without right. and, and and be sane and be wrong. That you can't just innocently be wrong about that. Um, and so that would be the lunatic option. And then there's the liar option. But we don't have, I mean, he might be a lunatic, in which case he's innocently mistaken, but that's the lunatic option. Um, you know, he'd be like Charles Manson, thinking that he was Jesus, um, or assuming Charles Manson wasn't just faking that to be a liar. But you have essentially the same trilemma with Charles Manson. He claimed to be the Son of God, he claimed to be Jesus returned, and he was either the Lord, he was either right, or he was a lunatic, or he was a liar. You got the same basic options there. Um, what Dawkins could be doing here, if you reconceptualize it and try to steel man it, is he by saying there's no good historical evidence Jesus claimed this, you could propose that what he's really doing is trying to introduce a quadrilemma that's sometimes posed where he's saying this is a legend. And at least this fact about Jesus is a legend. Um, but the problem is it's evidentially well supported. Um, also, another thing that is. Uh, I find problematic about this is that Lewis didn't use this as an argument for Jesus being who he said he was. What Lewis used the trilemma for is clarifying what your options are. Um, if if So you've got these three basic options, Lord, liar, or lunatic. You take your pick based on which you think the evidence supports. You can accuse Jesus of being a liar. You can accuse him of being crazy, or you need to be prepared to accept he was right, and he is the Son of God, and you need to take that seriously. But this is not an argument for Jesus being the Son of God. It's a thought exercise to clarify what are the options you have to choose from. And so I think Dawkins has fundamentally misframed this as an argument when it's not. It's an option clarification exercise. I don't really have anything else to add there. I was going to say that the last thing he says, uh, he says, as I say, in any case, as I said, there is no good historical evidence that he ever thought he was divine, mm -hmm. which I think does kind of, uh, like you said, it, it seems to introduce this fourth option of, of this legend hypothesis, which the, the, the issue is that every single one of these options is going to have something that you've got to work through in order to really like determine which of these options is the correct option. And that's, uh, like you said, if that's C.S. Lewis's point, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It actually is really helpful in order to frame the whole situation and get us to really think clearly about you know which of these options is uh, is the true one. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, Dawkins says the fact that something is written down is persuasive to people not used to asking questions like who wrote it and when, how did they know what to write, did they in their time really mean what we in our time understand them to be saying, were they unbiased observers or did they have an agenda that colored their writing. Ever since the 19th century, scholarly theologians have made an overwhelming case that the Gospels are not reliable accounts of what happened in the history of the real world. All were written long after the death of Jesus, and also after the epistles of Paul, which mention almost none of the alleged facts of Jesus' life. That all were then copied and recopied through many different Chinese whispers generations, and that's what Chinese whispers is what they call the telephone game in England. We call it the telephone game here in America. Um, by fallible scribes who, in any case, had their own religious agendas. Okay, bunch of stuff wrong there. Cameron, you want to go first? Um, I'm actually going to let you kind of take the lead <laughs> on this section. I'm, okay. I'm not really the the uh, the Bible apologist on my channel. I'm, I'm more mm -hmm. I, I like to come uh, yeah. philosophical angle from from things. I mean, I, I interview people every now and then uh, that will address the biblical stuff. So uh, we definitely address those things. But in terms of my expertise, uh, it's definitely more on the uh, the philosophical side. I mean, I mean, I will mm -hmm. say like the, this last sentence here: all were then copied and recopied through many different Chinese whispers generations yeah. by fallible scribes. Like that is is just uncontroversially wrong. Yeah. Like, just not even close to being true. We have very early uh, papyri uh, that are that are identical to mm -hmm. what we see in, in the scriptures now. And, um, yeah, there's there's no reason to think that there, the transmission of these uh, these early 
sources, you know, were sort of copied from other copies and they didn't have the originals throughout the time. Mm-hmm. And there, you also got to consider the fact that this happened over, um, well, we're, we're now very far removed from the events themselves. And so we're looking at things and trying to find archaeological data that existed 2000 years ago. And so for us, it's very difficult to find those things sometimes. And in, in, in our case, we have thousands, thousands of early uh, fragments. So we, we have tons of data that we can draw on. Um, but we're looking at, we're, we're looking for archaeological evidence that would have existed 2000 years ago. And so for us, it might be very difficult to find, but for people back then, like there was probably tons and tons of these things floating around in the original copies. And so, um, yeah, it's just, I, like I said, that, that part, um, is just wildly false, okay. wildly false. It's, it's, it's a caricature. Yeah. It is. Um, okay, so I'll address this briefly, and um, anytime you want to jump in as we go through this section, just speak up. Um, cool. Okay, so he says, ever since the 19th century, scholarly theologians have made an overwhelming case that the Gospels are not reliable accounts of what happened in the history of the real world. Um, this is this is an argument uh, based on expertise, and what he's doing is cherry-picking the experts. There are skeptical scholars who hold that view, and there are other scholars who have said, absolutely not. These are highly reliable documents. Um, so he's, he's cherry-picking his experts. He's not accurately representing the scope of scholarly opinion on this. Uh, mm-hmm. Then he says, all were written long after the death of Jesus and also after the epistles of Paul. Okay, um, the that's con- controversial. I, the, I I know the, that for sure. Like some yeah. some people date, uh, you know, Mark for example to the fifties, right? And the epistles are dated to the fifties as well. Yeah. So according to a common estimate in scholarship, the Gospels were written between AD sixty five and AD one hundred, and that's a few decades. But it's not a huge number of decades. Others, and this is currently a minority position, but it's been gaining ground. Um, place the dating of the Gospels a little bit earlier, and I've done an extensive study, I fall into that camp. And it's not all conservative scholars who hold this view. Uh, Liberal scholars like um, Adolf von uh, von Harnack and John A.T. Robinson also are early daters. And my own views, at least with regard to the synoptics, are very similar to those of Adolf von Harnack. Um, I would say that the Gospels were written between approximately A.D. 55 and 65, and that that puts them contemporaneously with the epistles of St. Paul. Then Dawkins has a little mention that St. Paul's epistles uh, mention almost none of the alleged facts of Jesus' life. Well, they mention the important things, like him being crucified and raised and being the Son of God and stuff like that. But... um, this is this if he's if he's saying that which i think he is to try to cast doubt on what we know about jesus you have to take into account the fact paul's writing letters he's not writing gospels he's not writing a biography of jesus he's writing situ- he's writing letters to churches that have pastoral needs and he's addressing those pastoral needs so of course he's not going to give us an extensive biography of jesus in his letters it's mistake Literarily, it's a category mistake to expect a group of pastoral letters to give us a detailed biography. Um, he, let me play devil's advocate real quick because okay. you played devil's advocate in sure. my response. So, um, oh, time for push payback. back a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, here's one, maybe one reason to think that the gospels were written later. Mm-hmm. Um, because you just said that you take an early view. Mm-hmm. Um, wh- one of the main arguments that I've heard is that, well, the Gospels actually mentioned the destruction of the temple, and that happened in AD 70, and so it must have happened, therefore the Gospels must have been written after the destruction of the temple. Mm-hmm. So how do you respond to, to that argument for a later dating? Oh, I love this one, because I think it's actually an argument in my favor. Um, one of the things, now first thing is, you got to recognize, Jesus didn't even have to be supernatural to predict the destruction of the temple. Other people prior to the destruction of the temple, predicted it was going to be destroyed. My favorite example of that is a guy who, four years before the Jewish war started with Rome, so it started in AD 66, this would have been AD 62, his name is Jesus Ben Ananas. 
at, or Jesus, son of Ananus. And he starts prophecy in the doom of the temple. You know, Josephus talks about him. He, he, would, he would say, a voice from the east and a voice from the west and a voice against the city and against the holy house. And, and they thought, is he some kind of revolutionary? So they took him to the governor Albinus, and he beat him so severely that his bones were showing. But he wouldn't stop saying all this. And they finally, Albinus finally concluded he's a madman and let him go. Um, and so he would just go around Jerusalem for four years proclaiming its doom and how it and the temple are going to be destroyed. And then the war starts. And his, I love his ending. It is so awesome. It is terrible, but it is awesome. He, uh, the war starts, and the Romans are besieging Jerusalem, and they're using ballistas you know, to throw big rocks at the city. And um, and Ben Ananus is walking around the city walls, and he's proclaiming the doom. It's like, woe to Jerusalem, and woe to the temple, and woe to the people. And then he sees a rock coming at him from a ballista, and he says, woe also to me, and he dies. <laughs> and, um, so it's terrible, but I think it's hilarious. Um, so he's just one example. There are others. The, uh, the Essenes who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they thought the temple was going to be destroyed too. So you don't even have to be supernatural to predict the destruction of the temple. It had already been destroyed once by the Babylonians, and there was a huge fear that the same thing could happen again, and various people predicted that it would be. So what do we find when we look at these passages pertaining to the destruction of the temple in the Gospels? Well, one of the things that we know the evangelists love to do is predict prophetic is record prophetic fulfillments. They'll say this happened in fulfillment of this prophecy. Matthew, in particular, is known for doing that. He's got all these Old Testament prophecies, and he says, "And Jesus did this because it fulfills that prophecy." Also, when Jesus made his own predictions, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be. Uh, arrested and turned over to the Gentiles and crucified, and then I'm, ri I'm going to rise on the third day, they record the fulfillments of that. Or in Acts, when the prophet Agabus predicts there's going to be a worldwide famine, Luke immediately notes, and it happened in the reign of Claudius. Or later, Agabus predicts Paul's going to get arrested, and Luke records the arrest. So one of the things that, um, that would have happened if the, if the evangelists had written after the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, they would have recorded Jesus' prediction of the temple's destruction, and then they would have said, and it happened, just the way Jesus said it would, because they want to show Jesus as a true prophet. That's their agenda that people are talking about. They want to show Jesus as a true prophet. They would have acknowledged his biggest prediction, other than his own death and resurrection, was fulfilled. The fact that none of them do that is a big sign that they were written before that prophecy had been fulfilled. And so they accurately recorded Jesus' prophecy, and they expected it to be fulfilled. Also, Jesus talks about his coming in connection with this event. You know, you can read about it. It's in Mark 13, Luke 21, and Matthew 24. Um, and Jesus talks about he's going to have some kind of coming in connection with this event. Well, in the Old Testament, God comes in various ways, uh, like he comes in judgment on different cities. But Jesus also predicted that he was going to have a second coming, and where he physically returns to earth. You know, that's right there at the beginning of Acts, where he predicts that and the angels confirm it. Okay, so if these Gospels were written after A.D. 70, why don't the evangelists clarify that the coming that occurs with the destruction of the temple is not the same coming as the second coming? Because it, it's going to cause confusion in the readers if they have this Jesus comes language next to the temple being destroyed language, it's going to confuse people. Matthew makes it worse by at the end of chapter 24 and in chapter 25, he adds several parables that clearly pertain to the second coming. And that would be unimaginable that Matthew would write that if he was writing after AD 70, because he'd be combining material about the destruction of the temple, which happens in AD 70, with stuff about the end of the world. And it's going to just confuse his readers to do that. The much more logical explanation is that Matthew was writing before AD 70, and so he combined all of Jesus's prophetic stuff together 
Um, and it, because it's all on the same topic, Matthew's a topical organizer. His gospel's written around five discourses that have topical themes. So he just took all of Jesus's prophecies and put them together. But if he was writing after AD 70, it would totally confuse the reader to have destruction of the temple material next to second coming material because it would make it look like Jesus was wrong because the second coming didn't happen right after the destruction of the temple. He would have needed to distinguish those two events. So that's what I'd have to say in short form about uh, about that charge. I think it actually plays in my favor for the early dates. It makes me think about the recent stuff that we just covered on, on uh, Brandon Biggs. Uh -huh. How he predicted the assassination attempt on uh, on Trump, and um, you know he he predicted it in some detail. I mean, there's there's obviously a controversy about how much detail um, and whether he got any of the details wrong and stuff. But um, just because he predicted it earlier, does that mean that he's a true prophet? Does that mean that it couldn't have happened? Mm -hmm. I don't think the answer to that is is yes. Just like. Mm -hmm. Um, so th this argument that you know if these if the gospels predicted the destruction of the temple, um, then it had to have been written after the temple was destroyed. I don't think that that's anywhere near remotely true. I mean, and and I, I, like no one or at least no skeptic is watching the prophecy from Brandon Biggs and being like, oh well, now we know that the you know prophets are real because he predicted this four months in advance. Like no one no one is doing that. And so then why would you try to apply the same thing to the gospels just because you may an earlier prediction doesn't necessarily mean that some, some something supernatural is involved here and that you've got to rule that possibility out um like you said there's other people that have that predicted the destruction of the temple and um if the climate the atmosphere around that time was uh tension was growing and stuff then it wouldn't have been too improbable for someone mm -hmm. to to be able to, to rightly make that sort of prediction back then and so yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I think that's a really terrible argument for uh, a later dating of the Gospels, especially if that's like the main argument that you use, which um, to my knowledge is is one of the primary arguments that people yeah. use to, to prefer a later dating. It's it it's wild. Okay. So just to close the loop on this paragraph from Dawkins, uh, he then says all were – um, all of the Gospels were then copied and recopied through many different Chinese whispers generations by fallible scribes. And as you pointed out, that's nuts. The, he's even misapplying the Chinese whispers or telephone game argument. Normally, when that's applied, it's to the process leading up to the writing of the Gospels. But once the Gospels get written, they're, they, we have a stable text that's only going to have minor scribal variations. Chinese whispers or telephone game is an oral process. It's not a literary game that people play. It's an oral game. Uh, and and it, But yeah, but even then, it's just so, so... Yeah dumb it's yeah, so dumb like it is the, the the chinese whispers game is intended and set up in such a way that it's going to produce unreliable results within yep. you know just a few generations and how do you do that how do you accomplish that you prevent you you have to whisper first of all so it's got to be quiet you can't no one can listen so you gotta like cup your hands and stuff and then you you can't repeat it like you you say it one time the person gets it and then they go to the next person and so but that didn't happen like there people yeah. were living people were <laughs> talking out loud um In they church. could ask questions mm -hmm. yeah they could ask questions they could uh double check and make sure that what they were saying was accurate and all that and so it's there's there's i mean yeah no yeah. similarities at all no I've, similarities i had planned to do an actual experiment where i use uh, an actual telephone uh system to test this hypothesis, um, mm. where I have a tradition, and and actually it's three traditions of different lengths, but I have I have three traditions, and the volunteers for the experiment will sign up to learn the tradition and then call in to a specific telephone number and recite the tradition as they remember it. And then I take the recording that they gave and give it to the next participant. They get to listen to the first recording, and then they they wait until they feel comfortable, and then they call the telephone number and repeat their understanding of the tradition based on their memory. And we keep doing that and see how many generations – unlike the children's game – 
we tell them take this seriously. This is a re- consider this a religious duty, which is what it was for early Christians. You need to repeat this accurately, and with with that instruction, see how many generations it goes before we get notable deviation. And so that's an experiment. I've done a little bit of work along those lines. I plan to do that one day, and if I do, I'll need to publish a paper about it as a as a you know debunking of the telephone game argument. But that'd be interesting. Yeah. By the way, my favorite example of a telephone game is on The Simpsons. There's one episode where the teachers are on strike, and Bart starts a telephone game among the picketing teachers, and he starts by whispering to one of the teachers, Principal Skinner says the teachers are about to fold, you know, like they're about to give in to his demands. And you see the the whispers going up the chain of teachers to, to Mrs. Krabappel, Bart's teacher, and she says, I have just learned that Principal Skinner says the teachers are about to fold Purple Monkey Dishwasher. Well, we'll show him, especially for that Purple Monkey Dishwasher part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so. Just, just as serious as Dawkins' argument right here. Yeah. Just as serious. <laughs> so, so Dawkins says a good example of the coloring by religious agendas is the whole heartwarming legend of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, followed by Herod's Massacre of the Innocents. When the Gospels were written many years after Jesus' death, nobody knew when he was born, where, yeah, where he was born. But an Old Testament prophecy had led Jews to expect that the long-awaited Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. In light of this prophecy, John's Gospel specifically remarks that his followers were surprised he was not born in Bethlehem. Others said, this is the Christ, but some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh from of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? Matthew and Luke handle the problem differently by deciding that Jesus must have been born in Bethlehem after all, but they get him there by different routes. Matthew has Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem all along, moving to Nazareth only long after the birth of Jesus on their return from Egypt, where they fled from King Herod and the massacre of the innocents. Luke, by contrast, acknowledges that Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth before Jesus was born. So how to get them to Bethlehem at the crucial moment in order to fulfill the prophecy? Luke says that in the time of Quirinius, in the time when Quirinius was governor of Syria, Caesar Augustus decreed a census for taxation purposes. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, and everybody had to go to his own city. Josephus was of the house and lineage of David, and therefore he had to go to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. That must have seemed like a good solution, except that historically it is complete nonsense, as A.N. Wilson in Jesus and Robin Lane Fox in the unauthorized version, among others, have pointed out. David, if he existed, lived nearly a thousand years before Mary and Joseph. Why on earth would the Romans have required Joseph to go to the city where a remote ancestor had lived a millennium earlier? It is as though I were required to specify, say, Ashby de la Zouche as my hometown on a census form if it happened that I could trace my ancestry back to the Seigneur de Dacien, who came over with William the Conqueror and had settled there. Moreover, Luke screws up his dating by tactlessly mentioning that historians are capable of in- events that historians are capable of independently checking. There was indeed a census under Governor Quirinius, a local census, not one decreed by Caesar Augustus for the whole for the empire as a whole, but it happened too late in AD 6, long after Herod long after Herod's death. Lane Fox concludes that Luke's story is historically impossible. Uh, and internally incoherent, but he sympathizes with Luke's plight and his desire to fulfill the prophecy of Micah. Now, I've got a whole bunch to say about this, but we're running, we've been going for quite a while, so rather than go through everything I have to say, I'm going to refer people to where they can read it. Um, I, okay. had, I had a debate a while back with Bart Ehrman, and I knew he was going to bring up these same arguments. And so I, and I knew I would not have time in the debate to respond to them all because th- there's a law of, of information entropy. It takes longer to rebut a charge than it does to make the charge. So what I did was I put a bunch of articles on my website to pre 
his his arguments. And they're still available today. If you go to jimmyakin.com slash Bart, B-A-R-T, so jimmyakin.com slash Bart, you can get all those arguments that re- respond to these exact things. I also will mention one that's particularly notable here. Now, he says that this registration, and that's all the word in Greek means is registration. Um, Dawkins says it's for tax purposes. Actually, we don't know that. We do know that there was a different kind of registration where people swore allegiance to Caesar Augustus as the father of the Roman Empire, um, that 6,000 Pharisees refused to su- refused to swear to. Josephus talks about it, and we know it occurred in the year 3 or 2 BC, which is also the year we have evidence for Jesus being born in. So it's not necessarily a tax census. Also, if you uh, here on YouTube, if you go to my channel and search on Skeptics Debunked, I've got a video where I just read through Luke's Gospel and infer what a first century reader would have thought about what Luke was saying about Joseph. And he's not saying that Joseph was assigned to go to Bethlehem because his ancestor lived there a thousand years ago. What Luke actually says is Bethlehem is Joseph's own city. It's where Joseph lived. And that's why he goes back there. And then he adds the comment about um, about it was his city because he was of the, of the lineage of David. But what Luke says is Bethlehem was David's own city, so that's why he went there. But he was nevertheless working up in Nazareth, so he had two residences, his primary legal residence in Bethlehem and his work residence in Nazareth, just like migrant workers today have more than one residence. If, you know, there's a, if there are some, uh, some people from, let's say, Sinaloa province, Mexico, and they move to Arizona to do migrant work, they're going to have their family residence back in Sinaloa, and they're going to have their work residence in Arizona. And they don't have to be rich and have palatial homes. They're, they may be the opposite of rich, but they're going to have two residences because they need them both for their family base and because they need one for work. And that's what Luke's telling us about Joseph. He describes Bethlehem as Joseph's own city, and he describes Nazareth as Joseph and Mary's own city. So that's all I'll say about that. In the December 2004 issue of Free Inquiry, Tom Flynn, the editor of that excellent magazine, assembled a collection of articles documenting the contradictions and gaping holes in the well-loved Christmas story. Flynn himself lists the many contradictions between Matthew and Luke and the only two evangelists who treat the birth of Jesus at all. Robert Galuli shows that all the essential features of the Jesus legend, including the star in the east, the virgin birth, the veneration of the baby by kings, the miracles, the execution, the resurrection, and the ascension are borrowed, every last one of them, from other religions already in existence in the Mediterranean and Near East region. Flynn suggests that Matthew's desire to fulfill messianic prophecies, descent from David, birth in Bethlehem, for the benefit of Jewish readers, came into headlong collision with Luke's desire to adapt Christianity for the Gentiles, and hence to press the familiar hot buttons of pagan Hellenistic religions, virgin birth, worship by kings, etc. The resultant contradictions are glaring, but consistently overlooked by the faithful. So here, Dawkins is bringing in some elements of mythicist arguments. And yeah, he needs to just post this on uh, on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The hub for conspiracy theories. Yeah. He's also (laughs) just wrong. And, you know, scholars have debunked a bunch of this. Uh, There were not other virgin births in pagan religions. There were divine conceptions where, like, Zeus has sex with a woman. But that is not a virgin birth. You know, if if he has sex with Leto, um, then uh, Leto is not a virgin anymore. So the virgin birth actually is unique. In Christianity, not that that is essential to Christianity, but Dawkins is just misstating a bunch of stuff here. Uh, he can't just say these are all borrowed because they're they're not all borrowed. And even if some, even if they were borrowed, 
um, that wouldn't disprove that these things were true. Yeah, there's there's examples. I can't remember who the two figures are, but there's exam there's uh, similarities that you can draw between a lot of figures. I mean, I'm sure that Jimmy, even you and me, that we could draw, we could find some parallels between your life and my life mm-hmm. that we could sort of hone in on and be like, mm-hmm. well, look at those similarities. Like, shouldn't that lead us to think that both of these guys are just made up? Um, mm-hmm. You know. Myth- mythical creatures um mm-hmm. no that just shows that e- even if you found these similarities that just means that they had similarities it doesn't mean that you know th- these figures are not real historical I actually, figures i actually have a video where i you know people will point to oh here we've got uh this uh here we've got um isis holding the baby horus and that corresponds to the Virgin Mary holding Jesus, and so Jesus is just taken from Isis and Horus. And I have a video where I, I point that out, and then I also point out, and here is like the the Queen Duchess holding baby um, uh, Queen Victoria, and so that must be drawn from the Virgin Mary and Jesus. And then I have a photograph of my mom holding me as a baby, and I point out that's taken from Queen Victoria and her mother. So I mm-hmm. reveal to the public that I actually am a mythological figure based on Queen Victoria, who's based on Jesus, who be, who's based on Horus. Either you can, either you can conclude that, or you can conclude that they have pictures of mothers and children in every culture. Yeah, I mean, but you you can also, I mean, that that's one point to make, but you can also actually look at the details, look at what was actually said about these people, look at what was said about Jesus, and then compare and contrast. Is that actually accurate, or are they just using these sort of general terms that don't really even apply in both cases, but they're just trying to find some similarities, some parallel? I think one, one scholar called it parallelomania. Yeah. That's ultimately what it what it is i mean in general scholars don't take this view very seriously there are some very few but like even bart ehrman who you were talking about earlier like he Mm -hmm. didn't take this hypothesis seriously he's even debated uh richard carrier on this yep so got a question for you cameron we've been going for about two hours now and i just looked ahead and this section is several more pages and i could go through it really fast but I'm I'm thinking maybe it would be better if we put a pin in it right here. We can yeah. finish this section in the future and maybe just take a few more questions before we go. How does that sound to you? That, that sounds good because um, I, I think it's worth taking more time in this section. And mm-hmm. so we we probably would, I think, in order to to pay tribute to it, I think we should take our time with it instead of trying to rush through it. So, okay. uh, yeah, I'm happy to take more questions and then... And then uh, finish the rest in the next installment okay in that case i'm going to look down our uh, our chat window for questions that are flagged with a q at the beginning that way i know it's directed to us and not just to other chat participants jimmy real Here's quick uh, yeah. what, what do you got going on this weekend you got any big plans well um I'm, I may go to MUFON, to a MUFON meeting tomorrow, and I'm going to be working on Mysterious World scripts. And I'm also, uh, next start next week, I'm teaching a course on uh, Christianity and parapsychology. Nice. And I've already, if people are interested in taking that course, they can go to Rhine, E-D-U, that's R-H-I-N-E, E-D-U dot org. So RyanEDU.org, and it's called Psy and Christianity. Um, it's four weeks long. There will be a two-hour video lecture each week, and um, you don't have to be there live for it because the videos are all the lectures are all going to be recorded, and you'll have a minimum of six months to watch uh, the videos. Uh, we're going to be covering what Christianity would have to say and different perspectives from Christians on all the different areas of parapsychology. And uh, it's going to be very interesting. I guarantee there will be things you do not know that you'll learn in this course, because very few people know the stuff I'm going to be talking about. Um, so if people are interested, once again, it's Rhine, E-D-U, R-H-I-N-E, E-D-U dot org. I understand we're almost up to 50 students in the class, so it's, it's quite popular. And uh, people would be more than welcome. And so I'm, I'm likely to be doing some preparation for that this weekend also how about you nice what do we have going on this weekend i think i think just family stuff 
that's mainly it. It's mm-hmm. been raining like crazy over here. Oh. So we've been trying to like set up play dates and stuff with uh, some of our friends' kids and stuff to go like hang out at the pool or mm-hmm. whatever. And we haven't really been able to do any of that just because it's been raining every single day. So yeah. I don't know what we've got planned this weekend. Um, one of the things actually that we've been working on is cleaning our entire house and what I, like not just cleaning but organizing. Mm-hmm. So um, it's it's a really weird phenomenon like. So I, I'm not historically not a super organized person in terms of like cleanliness and stuff. But recently, as of like the last two or three weeks, I've like developed this big passion for cleaning everything and mm-hmm. keeping everything organized. Um, I think I was actually uh, talking with my therapist and I think we actually came up with a reason for that, mm. um, which I'll share on my channel a little bit. But um, so that's that's what we've been working on. Um, yesterday, my son's room was a disaster. Just complete disaster and so we spent some time yesterday um been planning it for a long time just organizing it putting toys away in the right spot that they need to go and 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 then when he uh got home from camp we like went through the whole room and taught him where everything is supposed to go and how everything is organized now and hopefully that's uh that's going to provide a uh a, a more rational structure for him to to have a little bit more success oh. with uh, keeping his room clean and and freeing up uh, some of the things that are causing us stress in our lives. We don't even sometimes we don't even recognize it. Like just having a dirty house can sometimes you know lead to oh yeah additional stress. And so we're uh, we're trying to minimize that and reduce stress in our lives. And um, yeah, I'm just I'm very thankful to God actually that. Um, I don't know if it's a permanent switch. Hopefully it is, but I've, I've been way more motivated and interested and, and have way more energy in general to, to go and do things. So, well, I so yeah, that's, that's kind of what's going on with us. We're, uh, we're, we're going to clean. Probably. Okay. Well, I'd encourage you in that regard. Um, I used to, this was years ago and I was in California at the time and I was living in a tiny, tiny house that had uh, all this stuff that I had brought from my three bedroom house in Arkansas to my one bedroom tiny house in California. And it was just too much stuff. And it, and as a result of it being too much stuff, it was just overwhelming. And it's like, where do I even start? And so I mm-hmm. hired an organizer and we went through it all. And after that, I kept it up. You know, I, I made a shift to where it's like, okay, I got rid of all the stuff that I didn't need to have. And I'm going to put things back where they belong now. And Mm -hmm. I've kept it up. I have not degenerated back into having a big mess. And so it can be done. So I just want to be encouraged. That's encouraging. Yeah. 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 That's great. One of the first things we did was uh, organize our closets. Like our Mm -hmm. closets were just complete messes. And so Mm -hmm. uh, we we organized those and put everything where they, where they should be. And I've kept that up for a couple months now. And it's, it's encouraged me to like start to clean out other areas. The next big thing for me is our garage. Oof. Mm. Oof. We've done part of it. We've done parts of the garage. So part of it is clean. Um, Mm -hmm. But man, there's this one section that is just uh it's daunting. That's that's part of what's sort of preventing me from getting started on it is just the, the thought of it is is almost too daunting. But just got to get in there. Just got to do it. You know what you may want to do? This is something I did when I worked with the organizer. Um, I kept a list uh, of tick marks, you know, where you do the hash marks, one, two, three, four, and five for a slash. Um, mm-hmm. I had a sheet of paper where for every garbage bag worth of stuff we threw away – or garbage bag equivalent, if it wasn't something that would go in a garbage bag, I put a check mark, and so I kept a record, uh, and I still have the 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 record. Actually, I'm not going to show it to anybody to show how many we threw away, but it was a lot. <laughs> and having that record of here's my accomplishments that can be encouraging when you're in the process of doing the cleaning because it's a measure of what you've already accomplished, and that can be a motivation to accomplish more. Good so idea. Something you might think about. Yeah, and then maybe even uh, reward yourself with yeah. uh, with something at the end of like once you get that that slash mm-hmm. that on the five, maybe um, reward yourself with I don't know drink or something yeah. else. Yeah, That'd be cool. Good idea. Cool. So let's do a few more questions. Uh, here we've got Neo Octuranius says, "Do you think God allowed the evil of the Islamic conquest of the Middle East and North Africa?" to bring about the missionary work done during the age of exploration and colonialism. Um, I have no way of knowing. Um, yeah. 
I read right. that too, and I, I was thinking the same thing. There, there's too many unknowns to be able to yeah. specify exactly the reason. And and usually, I mean, there's philosophers that talk about this in the problem of evil. They'll mention that, um, and this kind of falls more on the skeptical theism side of things, which is a, a specific type of response to the problem of evil, which basically acknowledges the limits of our knowledge. Like, we don't know everything. And, and some of these philosophers will point out that God's reasons are probably really complex for doing the things that he does, especially when it relates to these really uh, big events or long, drawn-out events that involve the suffering of thousands, maybe millions of people, something like the Holocaust. There, If we were to say the reason that God did this, in that situation, um, the answer to that is probably going to be super complex, and so th- those philosophers actually, uh, what are the on the on that basis, will argue. Well, we should we shouldn't think that we're in a position or even know what those reasons are. Um, I think, and I think you think this too, Jimmy, that we have some idea. We have some idea of the reasons that God allows suffering in the world. And so I would just, uh, at that point, go back and sort of appeal to those. So in mm-hmm. more generally, we can ask specific questions like, why did God allow this specific thing to happen? And we may not know the exact answer to that, but we can also, we can kind of pull back a little bit and, and look at the, the big picture. And the big picture is there are these great things that if God is to include them in a world or create a world that has those in them, suffering is going to be accompanied with those things. So for example, uh, like courage, okay? Uh, if there's going to be someone who exemplifies courage in the world, you can't exemplify courage without there being some sort of something at stake, something that you've got to be courageous about uh, in the face of some sort of danger, something along those lines. So, uh, and, and we can't say, we, we, we may not be able to say we know exactly the reason why God allows this, 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 this in these specific cases, but we can a- appeal to these uh, these broader theodicies to, to explain some of them. And I, I think that may be where you're going is that we don't know we may not know the exact reason but we can still point in a sort of general direction it's it's always a matter of speculation and sometimes we have good speculations and sometimes we don't and when we sometimes we can propose things but we can't be certain and we'll just have to wait until the afterlife to find out what the real reason or complex set of reasons was mm-hmm. okay uh la forja del creyente says, can we Catholics pray to the other four archangels that the Orthodox have in their tradition? If not, why? And how does how does this would be resolved in a future reunification of the church? Okay, um, so this is more of a theological question. Uh, Catholics could not, by canon law, uh, pray to the any other archangels besides Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael in church as part of an official church prayer because in order to uh, have public devotion to a saint meaning done under the auspices of a church and we're not talking about what you say privately sitting in the pew but we're like talking reading out a prayer you know for everyone in the church to pray together um the any any saints that are invoked there whether they're human saints or angelic saints they have to be in the roman martyrology and so St. Gabriel, St. Michael, and St. Raphael are, but they're the only ones. So you couldn't, as part of an official church prayer, pray to them, at least not until some future reconciliation. But uh, there are no limits on who you can invoke privately. So if you think that Uriel, who is the fourth one that is commonly mentioned in Uh, Orthodox circles, if you think that Uriel, whose name means light of God or God is my light, um, is a real entity, then you could could privately pray to Uriel. And if Uriel turns out he's not real, God will have some other angel take care of the prayer request. It's not like it's just going to go into a dumpster in heaven. Um, heaven's a place of love, and if if you're asking someone to pray for you who's not there, someone else loves you enough to take up that prayer request. At least that's how I would put it. Any thoughts, Cameron? Uh, no, I don't have any on this one. I was actually going to ask you to uh, answer the last part of the question. How mm-hmm. would this be resolved in a future re- re- reunification? Well, we don't know for sure, but um, I suspect that a based on various trends that are in, in, in process right now, that it's likely that in the future there is going to be a an evaluation of do we really need to be divided on this point? 
And if we didn't previously needed to be divided on it, then it's likely that, that the Catholic Church is going to say we don't need to be divided all over it in the future. So, for example, um, there's there are some cases of this already in place. Like there's a disagreement um, within Catholicism on when does transubstantiation happen in the Mass. Is it at the words of consecration, which is the traditional view in the West, or is it at the what's known as the epiclesis, which is where the priest invokes the Holy Spirit to come down and transform the gifts? That view is common in some of the Eastern Catholic churches, as it is in Eastern Orthodoxy. And so the church is okay living with this duality of theological opinion. On We both agree transubstantiation happens in the Mass. There's a, there's a difference of opinion about exactly when does it occur, and we don't need to be divided about that. I would propose the same thing is likely to happen with regard to angels. Now, I don't know of four other archangels that the Orthodox have. I'm aware they have one other named archangel that is present in their devotion, that's St. Uriel. There are, though, besides the three named ones that Catholics have, there are four other archangels that are mentioned in Second Temple Jewish literature. Like if you read the Book of Jubilees, or you read the Book of Enoch, it's going to name all seven of the major angels. Um, and so they're out there outside of the Bible. But the Catholic Bible has only three that are named. The Orthodox Bible has four that are named. And my suspicion is that in the event of a reconciliation between Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism, this would not be viewed as an issue that needs to divide us. And so Catholics would be comfortable praying to the three that are recognized in in our canon, and Orthodox would be welcome to pray to the four that are recognized in their canon, and we don't really need to fight about it in the future because we didn't fight about it in the past. That would be my guess. I have, I have some thoughts, but I don't yeah. know if they're worth uh, expressing. I mean, oh, you got to say maybe, now. You don't leave us hanging. I would just say, um, if, if there were to be some sort of reunification, I think it would have to be under the heading of humility, and I think that would mm -hmm. just fall under the same category, like mm -hmm. being humble and just recognizing, especially like uh, when it comes to the authority of the Pope. Like that is one of the things, one of the major things that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eastern Orthodox are going to have to be humble about if they want to see unification with the Catholic Church. And so um, I think other sort of subsidiary doctrines like this or uh, or practices would have to be um, given the same treatment mm -hmm. of humility. Yeah. So. And this would be an example of something where Catholics could be humble about it. We're not insisting that you drop your devotion to Uriel. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nero Octoranius says, Jimmy, what do you think Jesus's life was like prior to the beginning of his recorded ministry? Um, so I'll do a mysterious world about this in the future, but basically I think he was living, uh, um, we're talking about after the flight to Egypt and really after the visit, after the appearance in the temple when he was 12. But during his, that his so-called lost years between 12 and 30, I think he was living as a carpenter in Nazareth. I think it was not a big, glamorous, exotic experience. He he was uh, making stuff, and we even have, if you look in at, from around the year 158, AD 150, uh, Justin Martyr in his dialogue with Trifo in chapter 88 says Jesus was making plows and you know, farm implements and stuff like that for people. So I think that's what he was doing. They didn't, they were a poor family. They didn't have the money for international travel. So no trips to in England or India or Monaco or other places. Yeah. My, my thought is, is something similar to that. And I think his ability to keep things under wraps would have just been, I guess, res as the result of him being so secluded in his work that he's doing and especially where he lived i think it's possible like you you've probably had an encounter like this jimmy where you've met someone and you're like you're like a really interesting person but like does anyone know that you exist like do you even have an online presence like you're you seem like a really interesting person um and i feel like that's probably a similar experience that people had when they met jesus is like you're interesting um but what like 
I guess just no one really knows about you. And mm -hmm. I think that's just kind of how it was uh, up until the public ministry started. That's mm -hmm. at least my my speculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I it, it just interacting with that. I, I tend to not make a big deal out of myself, you know, in my private life. So I don't. Hi, I'm Jimmy Aiken, Catholic apologist, or any. I don't do that. You know, I'm just this guy who happens to be there, uh, wherever I am. Um, I I do have uh, one story that kind of intersects with that. Now, back in the day, they've hidden it now, but it's still there. But Google used to display how many hits there are in its search engine when you search on a particular term like mm -hmm. if you if you search on jimmy aiken it'll tell you how many references to jimmy aiken it 12 has. million hits yes whatever the number is and so i had a um I, I i i took back when i first learned to call dances i took i went to several different caller schools and one of them was a caller school that was run by a caller named Nasser Shuker. And Nasser is a really funny guy. He's got a kind of larger than life personality and he's an internationally famous caller. He goes all over the world, call, world calling. He's got a great sense of humor. And, um, and he, in an email, because he was emailing, you know, to people on his email list, he mentioned that he was in a, in an airport in, it was some Scandinavian country, let's say it was in Helsinki. And so he's in this airport in Helsinki and he's feeling bored. And for one reason or another, he was shouting at the top of his lungs that he wanted to meet someone famous, which is a kind of Nasser thing to do, I guess. And so it, the people there could speak English. They heard what he was shouting and they brought up to him this guy who was a local celebrity and he got to meet someone famous and so he was telling this story in to the folks on his email list and i emailed him back privately and i said if you ever because i had never made a big deal of who i was when i took his caller school i was just a student um i said you know if you you may know more than one secretly famous person google my name and he did and saw how many hits there were and so i revealed to nasser that i was secretly famous <laughs> Um, Nero Octoriana <laughs> says, Jimmy, how do we explain the two different Jewish, Judas suicide and death verses in the Bible? I think they harmonize. Um, and so I think Judas hung himself, and then it, it, there are different ways of doing it, but um, I'm trying to think. I, I know I deal with this in my book, A Daily Defense. Um, I kind of don't want I can't remember if it's Mike Lacona or mm -hmm. uh, Lydia McGrew that suggests he hung himself and then fell and then his that's uh, that's a common one I also it's possible to work it the other way around but it is common to propose he he hung himself and then you know the rope snapped or slipped and he fell and burst open um, that's certainly the most common way that that's dealt with although there are some other possibilities uh, let's see. Any other questions? I'm trying to. We're getting down near the bottom of the list. So just quickly scrolling. And it seems like it keeps generating new stuff every time. But, uh, ah, here's one. The Last Frybender says Why did it take so long for the canon to come together? Why not earlier? Why not earlier and why not later? Why would God not be clearer with the canon he wanted once the canonized writings had been completed? Okay, so the answer is the canon is not a high priority if you also are relying on tradition and if you have an, a teaching authority. Um, and so because you don't have to look to Scripture alone to get the answers to your questions about the faith. You can also look to the tradition that's been handed down from the apostles, and you can look to the church teaching authorities to tell you the answer if you got a problem. The, it only, the question of the canon only becomes urgent if you assume that you have to look to Scripture alone to get the answers. And so the church didn't feel a need to immediately define the canon, and it, 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 it grew slowly, um, by the early 300s, the broad outlines were there, but if you look at Eusebius of Caesarea, he's still got a bunch of books that are 
questionable. He's got books that are definitely in, books that are definitely not in, but then he's got these questionable books. And they include some books that are in the New Testament now and some books that aren't. Um, so there was a dispute or debate about these this middle class of books. The debate was largely resolved in the West by the end of the 300s and the beginning of the 400s, when we start having local councils that are endorsing basically the same canon list. It didn't become infallible, though, until the Council of Trent in the 1500s. And the basic reason it became infallible then is because Protestantism had appeared and it was categorically rejecting the Deuterocanonicals. And so that's when the church felt a need to deal with this infallibly. Um, because there was now a major movement that was denying what many Christians, most Christians, regarded as being part of the Bible. Uh, if you'd like more about the history of the canon, I'd suggest getting a copy of my book, The Bible is a Catholic Book, where I go through all this history in more detail. Cameron? Uh, I got nothing on that one. Okay. Let's see. Um... Jamaican Jerk says, is there any historical confirmation to go with the resurrection of Jesus that is extra-biblical? Uh, so there are references outside of the Bible to Jesus being raised from the dead. Um, that includes Christian sources, obviously, and there are also some non-Christian sources that at least appear to allude to the claim that Jesus rose from the dead, um, and that's definite in some cases, uh, but it's going to depend on what you're going to count as evidence here, and I would say you don't ultimately need to appeal to something that's extra-biblical, but certainly Christians outside of the Bible claimed Jesus rose from the dead, and non-Christians reported the fact that Christians claimed that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, in terms of are there independent claims, well, no, because if you believed he rose from the dead, you would tend to be a Christian. So anybody who had independent evidence that Jesus did rise from the dead would probably become a Christian, and they wouldn't have a non-Christian record saying, yeah, he rose from the dead. Yeah, I would... I would one of the things I, I think about when I see a question like this about, you know, is there sort of extra biblical or, or information outside of the Bible that's going to nevertheless still confirm that Christianity is true? I tend to think about what is the underlying assumption here? And the underlying assumption seems to be that um, in order to find like some sort of unbiased source mm -hmm. of information, we've got to look outside the Bible in order to get that. And because that's really what we ultimately want is something that is uh, unbiased to go off of. Because if we're going off of a biased source, that's uh, less reliable and it's going to, yeah, it's just not as, uh, as as a reliable source to to go with. Um, and the response to that is that actually the, uh, the non-Christian sources are going to be biased in different ways. And so you're not going to just uh, magically escape bias simply because you're looking at a source that is not uh, traditionally considered a Christian source or is not found in the Bible. Ultimately, what I think the best approach to do is to look for the earliest historical evidence for whatever claim that you're investigating and then try your best to determine whether or not that thing actually happened, given the historical sources. And the best historical sources happen to be Christian sources. And you got to do your best to try to wade through if there are any, like, you know, uh, if, if there is any biased uh, material in those sources, you got to try to work around those and try to find the historical core and then base your argument based on that. And I'm not saying that you're actually going to find any of those things. I'm just saying I think that's the, the best approach is to find the best historical source that you can find because they're all going to be biased in different ways and then just build your argument off of that okay brandon jones says how would you respond to the claim that the israelites borrowed all of their gods uh, including yahweh from the canaanites and the sumerians well i would respond by saying that the official israelite religion was monotheistic and it was focused on the worship of el or yahweh el is a generic term that just means god and yahweh is that god's personal name for Israelites. Um, there were, there also was unofficial Israelite religion where they did worship gods like Baal and Asherah and Anat. And yeah, they were influenced by the Canaanites in that. Um, and so uh, unofficial Israelite religion did heavily borrow from these other groups. Official Israelite religion, though, rejected 
the worship of other deities besides El or Yahweh. And we needn't suppose that there was no prehistory to El or Yahweh. There, in fact, we have evidence that there was. But uh, God progressively led the Israelites into a more refined understanding of who he was, that he wasn't just another god, that he was in fact the creator of the universe, and that he had formed a special covenant with them, and they needed to uh, to worship him only, and that any other heavenly beings that existed were inferior in status to him. Mm-hmm. And, and so there wasn't a denial that like other nations had heavenly beings that they worshiped as gods, just the claim was those are not equal to Yahweh. Yahweh is the uncreated creator, everybody else is a creature, and finite. One of the things I would point out is that when it comes to the doctrine of divine inspiration, mm-hmm. some people get, um, they, they don't really have a clear idea of what that doctrine means or entails. And so some people, some Christians think that the Bible, the way that we got the Bible is just that God sort of dictated exactly what to write to the individual authors, whoever was writing it down. And then that's what sort of became inspired. So it's almost like this divine dictation theory, which is actually a dictation, which is actually a uh, theory of inspiration that more aligns with Islam than it does with Christianity. In Christianity, that's not really the best theory on what divine the uh, the doctrine of uh, divine inspiration is all about William Lane Craig has a really interesting theory his is a what he calls a divine supervision theory where God was sort of supervising the whole situation so various people that were involved in the writing of the different books of the Bible God was supervising the whole process and really what's inspired is the end result it's not necessarily that God was Um, inspiring these people to just write something out of thin air and then they wrote it down and like that's what's inspired rather again god supervised the whole process and so these people that were writing things down could have been inspired from other sources other texts that ultimately made its way into the bible but that whole process was supervised by god what ultimately got written down and codified into the bible that's what is ultimately inspired so that's actually compatible with there being other sources that sort of inspired the text in the way that we see it now so i I think that's a a mistake that people make about the bible is that they think that it's got to be this sort of uh thing that came out of nowhere came out of like just out of thin air like someone was just praying one day um imagining what to write and then they just started writing and god was dictating to them in their mind like what to write um but that's not that's not the way that it works in uh the christian tradition at least christian tradition is that god is supervising this process which again is compatible with uh drawing on different sources that are ultimately the end product inspired by god Rebecca Lynn says, why don't y'all put your shorts on TikTok and Instagram? I feel a younger crowd could be reached. Uh, I don't know what your plans are in that regard, uh, Cameron. Um, I haven't done it yet because I do all my own video work at present, except for Mysterious World, and there's a limited amount of time in the day. But at some point, I may hire a video editor to, to look for excerpts like that and put them on TikTok or Instagram. I just haven't done that to this point. Yeah, I'm in a similar boat with you. I don't have any extra funds to, to pay uh, editors right now. I've tried that in the past, um, and I've, I haven't really seen much success. So I'm a little bit hesitant to allocate funds toward that at this time. Um, I think like the best... In, in my study of the YouTube algorithm and other algorithms, I mean, a, a lot of the same principles are going to apply across the board, not just to YouTube, but also to Instagram and TikTok. You want to have a video that people are going to click on and you want people to watch it as long as possible. Mm-hmm. And this, so with that in mind, I think the best way to approach these shorter videos is to treat them in, in a similar way that you would treat a longer video. So you want to have a hook at the beginning, you want to have content that's going to keep people engaged throughout the whole time, and so you you want to think of it like a mini long video, these little shorts and stuff. And um, so I, I think the best way to approach those short videos is to, to 
to treat them as their own independent thing. And I don't have time to, uh, to really devote to extra content on top of the content that we're already producing. Mm -hmm. I think eventually it'd be good to, to try and do more and, uh, and just take out clips and, and see if someone could edit them in such a way that, uh, it could satisfy those criteria and stuff. But yeah, just not right now. Eventually, hopefully one day. And I think we'll only take a couple more questions, and that should do it for the moment. Um, Nero Arcturiana says, Jimmy, do you think there could have been a highly intelligent human, human civilization prior to our recorded history? So it's important you included the word human, because otherwise we'd be talking about the Silurian hypothesis with someone in remote, in remote Earth history that wouldn't have been human. Um, I, so hypothetically... There could be a human-related civilization that has remained hidden, um, and that hypothesis is known as the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis. I will be talking about that on Mysterious World. Personally, I'm skeptical, and I don't think that we have any good evidence for a an advanced human civilization in prehistory. You know, there are people who will claim that uh, that the pyramids were built with some magical technology that you know was too advanced for the ancient world but but no we really don't have evidence for that there are also claims that the pyramids are tens of thousands of years older or at least 10,000 years older than than conventional history would date i don't believe that is true um i think that there were civilizations that were smart and that had more uh, prowess in terms of their material science than we would ordinarily give them credit for, like the people who built Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. They had, you know, they had concrete. Um, and so concrete is not something you would expect necessarily from a civilization that old. But concrete also is not jetpacks and rockets. So um, I think by ancient standards, there were intelligent advanced civilizations but by modern standards i don't think anyone was advanced by our standards and let's see i think there was one more question that i saw go by and oh here it is um the last Freibender says were the ancient israelites believers in monotheism or monolatry i think it's going to depend on how you define the terms and i actually have a mysterious world episode on this it's called god and the gods um it's here on my youtube channel so you can look it up it's also episode 112 so that's mysterious.fm slash 112 if it, it, it and it's going to depend on what you mean as i said if by theos or god you mean an infinite creator they were monotheists they believed there was one and only one infinite creator in their official religion on the other hand if you allow for a more expansive use of the term god to include the finite created gods of the nations then they were monolaters they, they said we should only worship the one infinite creator and not worship those other finite beings. Which seem, in, uh, seem compatible. They could do yeah. both. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they are compatible. For people who may not be aware, so monotheism is belief that there is one God in existence. Monolatry is belief that we should only worship one God. He's like our God. Maybe other people have their own God, but this one is ours and we worship only him. And I think it, it, in the infinite creator sense, there were, mono, there were monotheists, but if you allow the term God to be more flexible, they acknowledged other gods existed that were finite and created, but we should only worship the infinite creator. Yeah. So I think that'll do it for today. I think we've covered all the questions that came in. Uh, Cameron, anything else you'd like to say? Uh, no. I thought this was, uh, was fun. I, I wish there was more to, uh, to kind of go through. Uh, mm -hmm. I I'm cur I'm really curious actually if later in uh in later sections of the book does he ever raise the sort of traditional arguments for atheism like uh, the problem of evil. Oh, it's been so many years since I've read the book. I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, okay. So, uh really quickly on chapter 4, so this is the 
content page says why there are almost certainly is no God. That's mm-hmm. the That's title it. of chapter four. And then the subcategories are the ultimate Boeing natural selection as a conscious consciousness razor, irreducible complexity, the worship of gaps, the anthropic principle, uh, two sections on those, and then an interlude at Cambridge. So I don't see anything about evil, uh, hmm. which is unfortunate. But yeah, I mean, I can search the Kindle version and see if it comes up. Yeah, he probably mentions it at some point, uh, even if it's like in passing or something. But that's that's my only uh, thing to to note is that I wish he he had better arguments. Mm-hmm. That's that's the only that's the only downside of uh, reading this and spending time on it. To to me he, at least, I, I wish I could get more out of it. Yeah, he does have he does have some mentions of the problem of evil later. It's not a huge number, but he does have mentions. He also has. Um, I'm, I'm sure he has discussion of suffering in here. Yeah, he's got a bunch of reference to suffering. So he may be dealing with uh, primarily physical evil rather than moral evil. Okay. But I want people to notice, like, as you watch future installments of this, mm-hmm. I want you guys to to really think, and then this is going to apply beyond way beyond the God delusion itself, is I think the the most helpful way to think about God's existence is to put it in terms of different hypotheses, what data or what hypothesis best predicts that data. And I think once you start to, if you start with that framework, then it's going to provide a helpful uh, heuristic to really start to come to some better conclusions, I think, about the probabilities of Mm -hmm. these two hypotheses. And ultimately, like as a Christian theist, I think the probabilities weigh heavily in favor of theism. Um, And I'd like more people to know that too. But I want you to to think about that. Think about these these different hypotheses and then start to ask the question, okay, even when it comes to, to beauty or personal experience, like what hypothesis best explains that, best leads us to expect that phenomena to exist to occur and theism i think is is going to do a much better job of leading to that expectation whereas on atheism not going to get it not going to get it and if you do then you're going to be conjoining to atheism various things like evolution that are itself very unlikely on the hypothesis and so uh, you're you're nevertheless going to run into some very serious issues with uh, with atheism but yeah and hopefully we're gonna uh you guys can see that more clearly as we go through more of the book And next time, uh, look for our next installment over on Cameron's channel, Capturing Christianity. Okay, so thanks so much for joining us today, Cameron. And uh, I'm going to end the stream now. And uh, have a great day, everybody. See you guys later. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. I'm trying to grow my channel, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless you.